This video is a compilation of all episodes of the third season of Obscure Those Games series. 100 little known games, not all great, but all worth remembering. So, let's not waste any more time and watch it together. Operation Cleaner is a rather late as it came out in 1998 DOS strategy slash simulation game. Yeah, I can't really decide on what it is genre-wise, but I'm sure you'll understand why when I'll explain what it's all about. It's a unique title where you're a demolition expert and have to perform increasingly more demanding with each new contract demolitions. You could say that you'll explode your way into riches. Or even better, that you'll have an explosive success. Oh my god, both are cringe. Please remove them, Bruce. I'm Batman. Thanks, I knew I could count on you. So, your goal is to bring down various buildings with as little explosives and collateral damage to neighboring structures as possible. There are a few types of explosives available and they have to be used correctly, placed in strategic locations, taking construction and bearings placement in all buildings into account. While neighboring structures are often protected with dampers, if you go all out, they won't hold. So plan smartly, plant smarter and explode the smartest. Jesus, I think I'm having some kind of a case of leak of IQ points here because I'm making less and less sense with each sentence. But you knew what you were signing up for when you played this video. And if you didn't, and it's your first time watching my content, then first of all, hey, I'm glad you're here. Then, well, get used to it, it doesn't happen often, but I tend to either go off the subject or lose my mind on occasion. Anyway, Operation Cleaner's presentation is rather simple, with sounds being reduced to absolute minimum and graphics displayed in very basic side view 2D. That said, the latter kinda makes sense as the underlying physics engine has to make quite a few calculations to figure out what happens during and after each of the explosions. It's not overly sophisticated engine however and you can find yourself in a situation where most of the building still stands after a large set of explosions all based on a single random pillar, defying all known physics. It happens from time to time only but it does and is still near always surprising. The most important thing however is that despite all that the game is fun. So if you like unusual titles give it a go. Perfect Assassin is a sci-fi point-and-click action-adventure hybrid with a heavy emphasis on the adventuring. Brace yourselves, cause I'm gonna throw some odd names at you while I summarize the story. You're the perfect assassin, an incredibly skilled and proficient at what you do, half man, half robot. The bottom half is man, I guess. I have no proof. Your name is Charon and somehow in an unexplainable way you've lost your memories of everything about you other than what you do. You are contracted by the individual going by the name of Aldi Grag, yep, Aldi Grag, odd name, I know, and he has a mission for you and asks to meet you on the remote planet of Karnak. And just as you land on it, the game starts. For the most part, Perfect Assassin plays like a typical point-and-click adventure in which you walk around various interesting sci-fi themed environments, collecting items, solving puzzles and conversing with NPCs. But not only, as there's a bit of action a la Alone in the Dark, but much sparser in it too. Interestingly enough, during conversations you can adjust your tone to be meek, normal or aggressive. And this choice, depending on who you're talking to and what about, can actually influence the outcome of those conversations considerably. In fact, some situations will require you to pick a correct stance to push the plot further. Some characters, for instance, respond better to threats and are more willing to share information when worrying about their well-being, and the like in real life. As I mentioned before, from time to time you'll have to resort to violence, as assassins do, and to do so you'll need to point with your mouse at the target, and I said target cause shooting in perfect assassin, believe it or not, does not always mean killing even if you do some of that too. Sometimes it's a part of environmental puzzling. So yeah, there's that. Perfect Assassin was released both on PC and on PlayStation and given the clunky controls I have to guess that the developers were more concerned with it working comfortably on the console rather than PC. Don't get me wrong, the controls are not terrible, just hard to get used to. For me. Anyway, the presentation as you see is quite terrible for 1997 and I don't really know what else to say about it. It's in high resolution and yet somehow the main character manages to look pixelated and ugly. It's meh. Overall, I wouldn't recommend seeking Perfect Assassin out to play it unless you're an adventure games fanatic and have to complete them all. Then there's definitely something in it that you may end up enjoying, especially the story and an unexpected mix of shooting and adventuring. Piranha is an excellent, even if a bit float, top-down arcade shooter in vein of asteroids. Only bigger, better and more varied. Ok, saying that it's better may be far-fetched, as while well, asteroids may not be chock full of different upgrades, enemies, weapons and such, same way today's game Piranha is, it's a classic. 
and just because of that, its internal score in my head gets bumped up at least 2 points. And Piranha is a game I gave a passing attention to years ago and managed to completely forget about it until today, which is actually a few days ago for you as you're watching this video, and I could never forget Asteroids. Anyway, Piranha is composed out of 100 levels and features loads of different weapons and upgrades basically from the get-go. There's also I don't know how many types of enemies, other than the obvious unanimated Asteroids, but it's a lot. And in general, Piranha reminds me a little of Super Stardust on the Amiga, short of faux 3D tunnel stages. Now, as Asteroids clones go, Piranha is probably one of the best. It's fast, action-packed and varied enough to hold your attention for 30, 40, perhaps even 50 levels. But 100? It's a lot. And even if it keeps changing enemies and you can purchase better upgradable weapons at the shop for money collected while playing, it gets old somewhere mid-game. I mean, when you upgrade yourself enough and get a grip on the gameplay, you can pretty much carry on throughout the game without the worry. Something that was impossible in Asteroids as it's difficult to ramp up quite quickly. On the other hand, Piranha being on a rather easier side is good for me. Because Super Stardust was always way too demanding for me to truly enjoy for prolonged gaming sessions. I don't know, man. On one hand, Piranha is great. On the other, it's just asteroids, but easier and more colorful. I think you're gonna have to make your own mind about it. What I can definitely say about it though, is that it sounds and looks amazing, and if you're a fan of the gaming loop it offers, the presentation will complement it all throughout. So yeah, play it or not, your call. Piranha is a decent fun asteroids-like game. One Simon's A Quest for Freedom is a game that is entirely based on Jill of the Jungle's engine. And that is the last good thing that I will say about it. It's a christian themed modification of Jill, and while I have nothing against any of the religions at all, personally not subscribing to their notions whatsoever, most religious games are historically rather weak. This one's not much different, I'm afraid. Sure, it may be a bit over the average for the subgenre, but that's not saying a lot if said genre mainly consists of reskins of other better games. You play as one Simus, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, but whatever, and you're a slave of Philemon. This one I got right. You aim to escape and regain freedom. To do so, you must get to Rome, meet Apostle Paul, and he will teach you of Christianity, which will free your soul. Apparently. Not the greatest, or even see that in logic story, but whatever. What we care about in platformers is gameplay and not the plot. They are not known, after all, to have the greatest stories anyway. One Simus is built out of randomly put together levels from Jill of the Jungle titles with some slight reskins here and there. You can jump and shoot from a spring with rocks. You can't morph into animals anymore though, which kinda makes sense in the context of the game so it's not really an issue. Funny enough, no sounds or music have been changed, so that's a bit odd, as whenever our protagonist dies he squeals like a girl, which Jill was. All in all, One Simus is a lazy outing. Not as lazy as I am Saturday morning waking up after a night of drinking with friends, teas, juices and soft drinks, obviously after all I wouldn't like to anger YouTube dieties with family and friendly content here, so yeah, usually brown teas with ice, sometimes with a splash of lemonade for good measure. Yummy. Anyway, having to play a fresh set of Jill levels would be pretty cool, even in this odd clothing, but if I'm to be frank, out of all levels in the game, only two or three at most are original, and not very well designed at that. The rest are just reskins from Jill's trilogy, and as such, I cannot recommend in good faith one Simus to anyone. Bad pun intended. While my most favorite sandwich of all time would be the BLT, hold the L and hold the T, I love pickles and could have them on any and all of my sandwiches. I'd even risk trying them on a PB&J. They just seem to make everything better. They're great as a topping, as a side dish, and something to just randomly drop into something else and let your taste buds observe the effects. Hardly ever there a miss. Well, perhaps in ice cream, but I haven't tried it, so I'll hold off my judgment until I do. I mean, you like pickles too, right? Who doesn't? Also, Pickle Rick. Another great thing about pickles. So yeah. Pickle Wars is a game, a platform shooter that's actually not that bad, way better than the previous game we spoke of, and not because it's so great, because it's average at best, but because it's an original wacky title that does its own unique thing from start to finish and does not copy another game. Also, Pickles. In short, as the story goes, aliens who happen to be sentient pickles invaded human deep space colony of Arcadia and are about to conquer it in entirety. Since we've lived in peace for over 500 years, no one was ready for a pickle geddon. Patent pending. A sweet and sour wave of destruction went through Arcadia, destroying everything in its way. Only one person can stop the tasty destruction, and once again, it's you. And while I would advocate for literally eating of the pickles of the face of the colony, one by one, sandwich by sandwich until the colony is pickleless, it's not how you approach the situation. 
you resort to finding various weapons and killing them, softly, into a mash. But you know, I get it, you've been so long off planet, far away in space, that you may not know what you're missing, and this culinary scene, my dear viewer, is forgiven. But do send some of your victims my way as I'm about to grill the biggest burger this side of Milky Way and one thing that it's missing is a quality pickle. Pickle Wars is a shareware game where traditionally first episode is available for free and the remaining two upon purchase. But unlike Commander Kin for instance it feels a bit amateurish in it how it's made. The graphics other than the pickles obviously are rather simple and not sophisticated whatsoever, the animations lack frames to be considered smooth adjacent even and the sounds and music are just disappointing. You could say that Pickle Wars, same as real life pickle is an acquired taste. That some love unconditionally and others are just wrong. I say, try it out. If you like it, good. If you don't, pickles. Rally Sport is a 3D third person one or two player racing game. And for its time, despite looking simple presentation wise today, it was actually quite modern, offering simple driving physics and dynamic lighting effects. It can be played in practice mode or against the opponent, be it CPU or human. The latter can be enjoyed in either split screen and then it's a battle for the best lap time, or both can play on a single screen micro machine style, racing until one player gets far ahead enough to lose the other dropping him off the screen. There's 15 different tracks in Rally Sport set in grassy, gravel and ice environments, and they feature various hazards and obstacles all throughout. The road composition obviously influences how the car behaves on it, and it adds a lot to the fun and, dare I say it, realism of gameplay. There's 8 cars to choose from, though 3 of them use the same model just with different graphics. They all behave a little different. Toppling or driving into water resets your car back on the track, but it also costs you precious seconds, so it's obviously best to master all the car's controls so that it happens as least often as possible. Now, interestingly enough, you can go anywhere, but driving off the track is much slower than on it, so it's hardly useful even if it is possible. As far as I remember, Rally Sports does not support joysticks, meaning that in two-player mode you're both using the same keyboard, which translates to missed inputs from time to time on those older keyboards that did not have ability to read as many key presses at the same time. Not an issue in emulation or a modern gaming keyboard, but on original hardware may be something worth keeping in mind. Oh, and you can drive into spectators while racing. Not something I would recommend, but it can happen. So there's that. Philox is a single player 2D side view shareware sci fi arcade platform shooter. Unlike any other shareware games, not a third of it is free, but only two levels, which is probably for the best as it's incredibly demanding especially in its platforming sections and showing more of it off could be discouraging for potential players from investing into a full release. Story-wise, in a remote fortress hidden from the public, scientists have been running morally questionable experiments, genetically modifying and mutating insects. Why were they doing it? Nobody knows, but by the time the game starts, nobody will care either. As at that point the creatures gain sentience, follow a leader going by the name of Philox and have overtaken the fortress and its networks of underground tunnels. Philox resides at the very center, the heart of the fortress, in its breeding chambers from within he sends his luckies to stop you. You, playing as Reach Rocks, the grappling hook and jetpack wearing hero, who's the only person capable of clearing the fortress of the insect scourge. As usual, I might add. Oh, and you have a rifle and grenade launcher too. So that's your whole arsenal of destruction. Interestingly enough, in jetpack flying sections of the game the rifle shoots laser bursts and in the platforming ones, bullets. It changes nothing gameplay wise but was worth mentioning as a curiosity. Philox's graphics are not the best, I mean they're not terrible, but something feels off about them. It's hard to put the finger to what, but I feel like something's not right about them. That may be a me issue however and not something really wrong with the game. So check it out and let me know if you second the notion. Full version of Philox has been notoriously difficult to track down for a quite few years after it reached its unofficial abandonware status and only a few years ago it was found and resurfaced. Either way, it's disappointing as a game nonetheless. While Project X was a well-known and popular game on the Amiga, this horizontally scrolling shoot em up in the vein of R-Type was virtually unknown on PC. It was recognized on the Amiga as a very difficult and unforgiving title that had to receive a special version a year after its original release for players to even be able to attempt to finish the game. This DOS release is no different. It's a punishing shooter that throws hundreds of enemies at you, their movement patterns vary quite considerably, meaning that memorization is not enough to beat it and you have to be on your A-game all the way through, anticipating attacks from everywhere and reacting at Batman-like reflexes. I'm Batman! Okay Bruce, yeah I know, yeah, 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 okay. Man Bat's asking me to tell you that no one's reflexes are as good as his and that he could beat Project X with his eyes closed if he wanted to, he just doesn't. 
So yeah, anyway, Project X for a regular player is a game that will most likely not be completed. Its difficulty level is so ramped up that even access to numerous weapon upgrades, speedups and even temporary invulnerability among the in-game pickups does not guarantee progress. It's a Souls-like of shooters. Graphically, Project X is really nice, but hardly a show if it was two years earlier on the Amiga, as by 1994 those games already managed to overtake Amiga in presentation fidelity by a notable margin, and even as nice looking game as this one was nothing special on a grey box. Sadly, same can be applied to all other aspects of gameplay. I mean, take a look at Raptor Call of the Shadows that came out the very same year. It looks, sounds and plays like a game that's at least a generation ahead in its design than Project X. So, sadly, while being a fun title, if you're patient or proficient enough to go through it, Project X on PC was dead on arrival. Better looking, sounding and playing competition was already on the platform and even more games like Tyrion came a bit later, ultimately making Project X a forgettable, disappointing and a way too late released game. Ravage is a vertically scrolling shareware shoot em up, and it's rather excellent. It's perhaps not on the level of the giants of the genre, but it's really good nonetheless. It features 9 levels in the full version and hundreds of different enemies to dispose of. They come in large numbers and interesting attack patterns, so even though you're memorizing the way they move and act, it never really gets to feel old and tiring. All because of the variety. The better you do in a particular level, the more credits you will be awarded and have to spend in the shop buying new or upgrading weapons and your craft. And you can also save your progress between the stages, so that's always a nice touch, not having to go through the whole game on each playthrough. It's worth pointing out that the scrolling stops for the bosses and as much as you can just avoid regular enemies, you can add with them. So you either defeat them or they you. They are appropriately huge and deadly however, so it's always fun to get to them and try to tackle them and navigate through their attack patterns. If I'm to be honest, other than those screening sized gigantic bosses, nothing makes Ravage stand out from the crowd of other as good or better shooters. By the late 90s, DOS was not a platform that lacked good shooter maps, and the competition was rather stiff. Like that drink my father took 20 years ago before going to get a pack of cigarettes and never coming back. I'm kidding. It was milk that he went to get. Nah, nope, 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 not true again. A newspaper. Ok, I'll stop, he's actually fine and not gone at all. Interestingly enough, Ravage featured a very fun and well implemented two player co-op that allowed for simultaneous facing of the enemies and made the game considerably easier. Graphics wise, there's nothing to complain about, the sprites are nice, big and quite varied and the animation is butter smooth, so you're hardly ever going to get bored. That said, I feel that Ravage is one of those titles that look way better on screenshots than when you're actually playing it. I mean, it's not bad or anything, but it does have that uncanny shareware quality to its presentation that's somehow easy to spot on these days. Still, if you like shooters, it's definitely one not to skip. On the first glance, Ports of Call is a business simulation in which you manage a global fleet of freight ships, starting with just a few meager millions and an ambition to turn it into billions worth of fortune, balancing those profits and losses for the sake of your bottom line, all to grow your company into an international transport powerhouse eventually. And while it's actually a correct description of the game, it's also not all that it is. There are also quite a few random arcade-like elements of either docking in and out of ports, avoiding icebergs and even saving shipwrecked sailors among others. The game can be played in a very enjoyable hot seat multiplayer mode, where players compete for global freight domination in turn-based real time. Yeah, I know what I said. And that's where it shines the most. When there's few of you cramped at the single screen and you get to earn more than your buddies and then just to spite them purchase a whole set of brand new top of the line ships just to have them. Not that you need them. I'm obviously kidding. When you'll have them, you'll put them to use and earn even more money. Alternatively, you may lose it all with a few really bad business decisions in an early game, but you know that won't happen. Cause you're you and you're the best. What's most important about Ports of Call though is that it's not overly complicated management wise and not too difficult in its arcade sections. It's just perfect, so it can be enjoyed by players of various skill levels and genre preferences. If you'd like to learn more about it, I have a whole separate video on Ports of Call on my channel where I tackle it in much more detail. It's an old one, but everything I say there, given how much older the video than the game itself is, still stands correct. So, go and have a look. Red Cat 2 as the number may gave it away is a second game in the series and a very fun unique action platformer from Netherlands. Princess Dana, yes Dana not Diana, has been kidnapped by a group of vengeful mice led by an evil wizard and it's up to our ginger cooking pot wearing protagonist to save her. 
This will require you traverse through eight rather large levels, defeating hundreds of mice and eventually facing the evil wizard himself. Redcat can use various weapons that he'll find and pick up and will also collect useful items and treasures while adventuring on his way to save the princess. The screen can fill up with mice at times and while it's a neat effect seeing so many of them animated at once, it gets a little annoying gameplay-wise. The character sprites animations, especially our red cuts, are really, really well done and super smooth, having very cartoony-like quality to them. They're a pleasure to witness while playing. Same, however, cannot be said about the backgrounds, which in comparison look bland, boring and rather simplistic. Sure, there are some parallax effects here and there, but they're unimpressive nonetheless. Red Cat 2 is entirely in its original language, which means that most of us won't know what it's saying whenever it does. But it's so rare that it's largely irrelevant and even more so because it's a platformer, which are usually more well known for the journey rather than the destination, so to speak. Other than the presentation, there's not much in Red Cat 2 that would elevate it over any other platformers of the type. So it's not a bad game, but I wouldn't go out of my way to seek it out if you don't have it already. Rusty is what I am. Every morning when I barely crawl out of my bed and struggle for a few minutes to grasp where and who I am and what's ahead of me throughout the day. It's also a name of the fork that Joey Tribbiani from Friends had and totally not coincidentally what I called my favorite fork inspired by him 15 or so years ago too. He was a close friend of mine, as any other would be. The fork, that is. It was appropriately sturdy, didn't bend regardless of the force I used, provided it was within everyday use limits, it wasn't too big so could be used for both meals and desserts, it was the best. Sadly, he's not with us anymore. As six or seven years ago he disappeared without a trace. And yes, he and not it. And he'll be missed. Anyway, most importantly, in the context of today's video at least, Rusty is a side-view horror-themed action platformer conceptually very similar to much more well-known Castlevania series of games. Many, many years ago, Monte Carlo, not the city but the ruler of Transylvania, was sealed away by the seal of a sacrificed soul. As centuries have passed, however, the seal weakened and weakened and now monsters started appearing and roamed the land uncontrollably, spreading chaos and death everywhere and, worst of all, kidnapping young women from villages around the area. Nobody knows why. There is a legend, however, a folk tale, if you will, of one that will come from afar and save the land when in direst of needs of saving. And that one is you. Well, not you per se, but Rusty, a young beautiful girl who appeared seemingly out of nowhere in one of the villages seeking the source of the monsters. And you take control of her and you will succeed. So you, playing as Rusty, grab your whip that's Rusty and head into cursed land of Transylvania to kill monsters in a crazy mania. Okay. Not only it makes no sense, but it's also rather cringe. It is factually correct though, so you'll be searching for the kidnapped girls, fighting various different evil creatures and monsters and searching for keys to unlock the doors to progress. You know, things you'd do in your run-of-the-mill Castlevania game. But you can also run and swing from hooks, like Indiana Jones would. As you go through the game, you'll unlock special attacks and an old companion that will help you in combat. Overall, the Castlevania influences are present all throughout the Rusty and good, because it's actually surprisingly fun and well put to get a title, which may make you wonder why wasn't it more popular given the quality. Sadly, the reason is quite simple. It only released in Japan and in Japanese. And while you may not need to understand occasional text prompt or story snippet, even running it on our Western machines without crashing requires a special DOS extender. So yeah, perhaps here's the first and last time you see the game. Scorcher is an unusual futuristic racer, similar to Wipeout or Mega Race, so very fast, imaginative, bendy and fun looking tracks. There's no story to the game and while it may not be necessary in a racer, it would be good to at least know a background, a genesis of the races. But whatever, it is what it is. There are six different tracks and you have a turbo boost and jump to navigate them, which sometimes is not as easy as it seems initially because there's a little monkey ball in the game too. Namely, your bullet, craft or whatever you want to call it seems to be floating within the sphere-like cage that rolls on the tracks. So said jumping and turbo may be useful not only to overtake opponents, but also to stay within the confines of the course. All that said, Scorcher offers no level editor, no weapons or imaginative power-ups and nothing that would keep you playing for prolonged periods of time. So, the fun lasts for as long as it takes you to familiarize yourself with the six tracks that you race on. And it's not that long, I'm afraid. If I'm to be honest, to me at least, Scorcher feels more like a tech demo that should be added to a new 3D accelerator card purchase to show off its rendering capabilities rather than the full game. Anyway, since we're on the subject of presentation, while it's pretty decent for an early 3D, I am definitely not a fan of the draw distance, which is just a joke. You literally see maybe like, I don't know, 3-4 city buses in length ahead of you, 3 blue well stops. 
and the rest is just black cavity of nothingness. Why do I measure distance in buses and whales, you may wonder? Well, everyone knows more or less how long is either, and doing math between meters and feet seem like a chore that I'm definitely not gonna attempt it in my head. So yeah, Scorcher is fun, but it's also short and doesn't offer any additional content. So do what you please with that knowledge. Play it or don't, your call. Evil Northern armies have destroyed peaceful lands of Naipusan, and you playing as the ninja hailing from the region have to defeat their vile leader, the Shogun of Death. I know, epic. Shadow Knight is an always scrolling action platformer in which you go through differently themed stages, from village through cemetery all the way to the castle, and defeat various different enemies until you get to the final, forementioned wicked boss. You're armed with a sword or katana, I should say, really, and you also have some limited magical powers, so you can spawn projectile shots out of thin air like a true Sunday magician and heal yourself too. It all costs magical energy though, so you will have to refill it, and it's done by either collecting gold spheres scattered seemingly everywhere or completing levels. Believe it or not, but Shadow Knights was made by ID Software, the very same that's responsible for Doom. And while it's obvious from the get-go that it's very simplistic compared to their famous classic, some of their design style and craft can be noticed all throughout Shadow Knights. The action is fast and frantic at times, and the enemies come at you in groups if possible, obviously. The graphics for EGA, even if the sprites are rather small, are quite good and charming. And some later stages also have very bloody backgrounds, with gore and decomposed body parts coloring them in deep reds, another of ID staples. Overall, Shadow Knights is a pretty cool little action game, and if you like those, it's definitely one not to miss. The Evil King Dorf has kidnapped the princess and sent his overwhelming force of mechanical hoppers to attack the Golden City. I know, most of these names are quite silly, but it's a video game. As usual, in grim, difficult situations like this one, it's a toss between the two. Either you, so intergalactic superhero extraordinaire and university acclaimed lover, or Manbat. Apparently something happened in Gotham and he has to deal with it. I'm Batman. Oh, okay, I'll let them know. He says it's in Metropolis and not Gotham. Whatever. Thing is, you gotta save the Golden City, the very city where golden showers were invented. A BDSM mecca, so to speak. You place Mr. Potato Head but younger and have to save the princess and the kingdom, all at once. And there are three ways you can do just that. By building defensive bases that will keep hoppers at bay, by fighting with them directly, or by going after the King Dorf himself. Whichever path you choose, it always ends up with a conflict with the evil king and you defeating him. Because you can't lose if you're the protagonist, right? All the aforementioned will run various interactive minigames which are very varied and will test your agility. And while there's quite a few of different ones, they can all really be assigned to one of the two kinds. Either a shoot em up or, well, dodge em up. So you will either kill or avoid getting killed yourself. Controls are a bit flunky and take time getting used to them. But when you do, it's actually pretty playable, even if really odd title. Also, who doesn't want to play as Humpty Dumpty or Mr. Potato Head wannabe? In the last episode we tackled Pickle Wars, so it's high time that we talk about space vegetables. Eat your greens, kids, they're good for you. Maybe you'll learn to appreciate them more after hearing about this title. So, Space Vegetables is a simple side-scrolling shooter mixed with elements from Missile Command out of all things. Namely, Defense of the Domes, as everything else is much, much different. These are, however, not huge domes housing millions of citizens, but rather tiny itty-bitty ones used for cultivating veggies in an unfriendly-to-life space environment. So in each stage you have to collect a certain number of vegetables that grow in said domes to reach your daily quota to be able to carry on to the next level. It's not that easy though, as while the domes are state-of-the-art technology and can easily spawn flora without any supervision or external input, aliens that populate the area, for whatever the reason, are all out to steal them. Naturally, as you would have done with any other pest on Earth, these aliens have to be eradicated. And you have a laser and jetpack to do so. More laser than jetpack, but you know, jetpack's useful too. Some of the aliens, when killed, release small pockets of oxygen and they can be collected to refill your spacesuit's reserves. Vegetables grow inside domes in cycles and when they're fully grown and ready for collection, you have to pick them up to allow another one to grow in their place. When a daily quota is reached, the next day slash stage begins. Rinse and repeat until you've collected enough to be moved to another moon. And there's three of them, Phobos, Deimos and Riscos. And they serve as worlds in the game. If at any point all domes are destroyed or your oxygen reserves are depleted, the game ends. So, now, as you know how difficult and time-consuming it actually is to prepare all those veggies in the year 2040, perhaps you'll appreciate them more in your diet. Or not, because it's not PBS programming and you can do whatever you please with your life.
Speed Haste is one of those games that's incredibly fun and frustratingly terrible in the same time. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Firstly, and most of all, it's an arcade 3D racer. It features two different kinds of cars, either Formula 1 or NASCAR, and numerous tracks to race on. Funny enough, they're the same for both cars, which is perhaps a bit unrealistic, but Speed Haste is an arcade game, so we gotta excuse it this little oversight. That said, you can pick between the manual and automatic gears for that tiny touch of realism. But if I'm to be honest, given how floaty and slidey the controls are, I'd suggest sticking to automatic and focusing entirely on driving. There's no damage model in the game and the AI is beyond stupid. That's what I meant by speed haze being terrible. The CPU drivers are all driving along their invisible line that they're supposed to race over and they don't mind at all if there's anything in their way, which more often than not results in them straight up ramming into you just because you're driving over what they assume is their path. It's stupid, it's bad game design and it makes speed haste incredibly easy when played against CPU. All that said, when you enjoy it with a friend in split screen or even better three of them over IPX connection, speed haste becomes hella fun. Its fast furious arcade gameplay works like a charm against others. In multiplayer you don't mind the floatiness as much cause everyone's victim to it, so speed haste ends up being a lot of fun. If you plan to check it out, only do it if you have someone to play it with. Speed haste's sound design is ok, but nothing to write home about. Graphics, on the other hand, are pretty good for 1995 on PC and remind me a little of Virtua Racing or Daytona USA. They may not be on the exact level of the latter, but they're decent nonetheless. To summarize, Speed Haste is good in multiplayer and not as much against CPU. Period. Spirit of Excalibur is the second synergistic software's game after excellent War in the Middle Earth, and it uses the very same engine to tell the tale of Camelot after King Arthur's death. Unlike the first title, however, Spirit of Excalibur is divided into five chapters, each of being a small semi-contained campaign. In first, you, as a regent, are traveling to Camelot to claim the throne of England after King's untimely departure. In second, you must protect your lands from invading forces and try to re-establish order of the Knights of the Round Table. In third, after eventually bringing peace to the land, you must face the giant warrior who appeared seemingly out of nowhere and is causing trouble. Fourth takes place two years later and you must discover the meaning of your supporters' disappearances and find the source of the emerging evil forces. And finally, in last, fifth, you'll face your arch nemesis, Morgan Le Fay. In each of these chapters you'll be traveling around the overworld map and interacting with various characters, be it knights, nobles or commoners, doing everything in your power to complete your objectives. All this happens on the so-called scene view screens, which are close-up side views and will always display all characters taking part in conversation or interaction, whatever it may be. Outside of your main objectives, you'll tackle various situations which could be considered a day-to-day -day kingdom management. Simplified, no doubt about that, but management nonetheless. While Spirit of Excalibur is definitely an interesting, unusual game, it failed to live up to the expectations that the gamers had after War in the Middle Earth, and never gained any noteworthy following or recognition. Stack Up is a real-time puzzle game, and as with all games in the falling blocks genre, your aim is simple, to amass as many points as possible by clearing the screen in the most efficient way. The game board is a grid of 6x18 squares and you must arrange three colored groups of blocks falling downward so that they would form lines of at least three of the same color horizontally, diagonally or vertically. I realize that I've been calling them blocks or bricks when in fact in Stack Up they're different, rather colorful objects, but it's just my being used to games in the genre usually being a bit simpler than this one presentation-wise. And I know that you know what I mean, right? Don't answer, I won't hear anyway. Anyway, each individual object that's a part of the falling trio always drops as far as possible, so if there's a space underneath, parts of the group may end up at different heights. It's also a part of the puzzling strategy of stack up, to stack them up in the way that would then later on allow you to quickly clear the screen. So placing them seemingly without clearing anything at first does not mean that you're making mistakes. It may be a part of your grand strategy. And knowing you, my dear viewer, you'll have high scores left and right if you start playing. And not only because you'll be competing on your own PC offline against yourself only, but also because you're incredibly smart. I mean, if you weren't, you wouldn't be watching these videos of mine. Each level requires you to form a set number of lines and when you do so, you progress to the next. After that, it's pretty much rinse and repeat until you fail. Diagonal lines are worth most points, then there are verticals and horizontal ones are worth the least. While stack up is perhaps nothing to write home about, not shining in any of its aspects, gameplay, sound or graphics, it's a pretty fun overall package and a definite treat for fans of the falling brick puzzlers. 
Okay, if judging by the title in the first few seconds of the on-screen action, if I can call it that even, you assume that Star General is Panzer General but in space, then you're right, because it's precisely what it is. After covering various theaters, conflicts and even doubling into the fantasy, SSI launched into space with this unusual for the series outing. And while it's a fine and fun game, if you like top-down turn-based strategies that is, it was not a huge success I think they hoped for. It never gained as huge following and fanbase as the other games did, and never sold as many copies. I mean over the years it paid for itself, so was not a flop per se, but was far off the popularity and sales results more popular games in the series experienced. Which is odd, as it's a really decent title but perhaps not one fans of previous outings were eagerly waiting for. Star General features a whole slew of scenarios which can vary from small combat encounters to all-out wars, and also a random map mode which is there to extend the life of the title. A life that was sadly cut short by the lack of any real interest in the game. There's seven spacefaring races to pick between, humans obviously among them, twofold I might add, and they all fight for control of a local star cluster, conquering planets and star systems. Each race has a special unit, be it ground or space, and this can make or break the game, depending how well you and CPU use them. All ships have missile and beam values, which correspond to their combat strength and is used in resolving encounters. Land units use soft and hard assault values for that. Overall, between all races, there are 90 different types of units and many of them have specializations like troop transport, mine countermeasure vessels, reconnaissance and a bunch of various destroyers, battleships and such. There are also buildings which can be erected on planets like space docks, mines, factories and biodomes to name a few, and they all support your expansion and conquest. Research, while present, is rather limited. That said, even if it's basic, it cannot be overlooked, so keep that in mind. While never having reached popularity of other titles in the series, Star General is a fun, challenging strategy that will no doubt keep fans of the genre entertained all throughout. Quadrax is a side-view puzzle platformer. On the first glance it looks like nothing, cause while neat and clean, the graphics are not impressive for the time it released in and neither are sounds or music. Which while not bad, they're not anything great in particular either. But where Quadrax shines like a homeless hairless dog's balls is its gameplay. It's a game that's, at least when talking about its objectives, incredibly simple. You have two characters, let's call them red and blue, and you have to get both to the clearly marked exit. Simple stuff really. Only that it's not. Because other than the first few stages, Quadrax gets challenging real fast and throws logical problems at you at an astonishing pace. Which in a game like that, I'd like to add, is good. Because despite being difficult, it's not unfair and each level has a clear solution. And if you fail, it's your fault and your fault only. So, to complete the game, you're gonna have to switch between the two characters, pushing rocks, opening doors, switching levers, using teleports and so on and so on and so on. All to make sure that both reach to the exit unscathed. And it's not as easy as it may seem, cause death is everywhere. Behind every corner really. Or under every platform, I should say. And while there's no time limit for each of the stages per se, you have to make sure that neither red or blue falls from height, gets crushed by a rock or stuck behind badly attempted puzzle. And that's just scratching the surface. It's a game of wits and you'll have to give it your best to complete it. Quadrax features 100 levels, most of which are a puzzling nightmare in a good way, and unlike most other games in today's video, it's actually freeware today that can be downloaded from developers' website. If you like games like Lemmings, Fury of the Fairies, Lost in Mine or Benefactor, Quadrax is a natural next to add to your collection. Rallyke is that simple in its design. No, really. It could be described in two sentences and with the video running in the background you'd get what it's all about in literally 20 seconds. Or less. But I'll do you a solid and we'll milk it for a minute or so. So, Rally K is based on arcade original called Rally X, yep, the designers were masterminds of naming, and it's a top-down escape the maze type of eraser. You swoop around the maze collecting flags because someone once had fun with flags and you took it too hard, and when you grab them all you get to move to the next stage. Rinse and repeat. It's not that simple though, because Rally K effectively is an odd sharer Pac-Man clone. Cause while you collect those flags, there are ghosts, inky, pinky, excuse me, I meant other cars chasing you, and they want nothing more than to crush your beautiful machine. There are also rocks and trees that you have to avoid, but if you have a driver's license in real life, then you know that already. 
because they do the same thing they would have in real life if you drove into them. Now, if that wasn't enough, there's also limited fuel. And we just love car games with limited fuel, right? When it runs out, you don't stop, die or anything game ending, however, you just drive much slower. So navigating the maze and avoiding the enemy cars is considerably more challenging. That said, you are not defenseless, as you have your trusty smoke screen, which when deployed catches the enemy cars within and stops them in their tracks. Then they proceed for a couple of seconds to stay in a spot in deliberating confusion, questioning all their life choices up to this point. Rally K is a really simple game, it looks bland, it sounds terrible, screeching and farting from the PC speaker, but if you like those early arcade titles, you're gonna like it too. Starball is a pinball based on the Atari ST game called Spaceball. It has few interesting ideas and if you're a diehard fan of a genre, I can see you taking interest in it. For instance, there's only one huge vertically scrolling table that's divided into three smaller ones with sets of flippers on each, and when the ball falls between them, it drops to the table below it until it reaches bottom and then you die. I mean, if you manage to drop the ball there, cause you don't die just like that. Anyway, each of the mini tables has its own objective towards which you work on it and they're pretty fun and unique and remind me a little of the score display dot matrix screen mini games in other pinball games. On top of that, there are secret stages that you can unlock and get into for additional points. They're pretty imaginative, feature entirely differently playing game modes and are a definite highlight of Starbo. One of them is incredibly difficult to get to, so that's your achievement to get, for those completionists among you my dear viewers. Graphics, while not bad, are way below games released in 1996 standard, and compared to much older pinballs from 21st century entertainment, they just look dated and rushed. Sounds and music are, and let's leave it at that. Now, I love pinball games. I wouldn't say that I'm a hardcore fan of these, but I have my faiths in most if not all generations of gaming and like to get lost in them from time to time, as they're a perfect choice for a troubled mind. You get to play and enjoy them amassing points while having your mind free, for the most part, to worry about everything, everyone, to create dramatic scenarios and fill you with doubt all at once. Oh wait, that's just me. I'm Batman! Oh, uh, me and Bruce. I mean Bruce and I. You get it. Steel Hunt is a side-view sci-fi action shooter not unlike way more well-known and famous gunster heroes on Sega Genesis, with an exception that it cannot be played in simultaneous multiplayer, same way the aforementioned classic could. You can play as she or a he, and other than the sprites they don't differ much from one another and you start with two weapons, fast shooting machine gun or a rather useless shotgun. Both characters can however pick up additional weapons as they go, three for each, and they both have different unique ones, so I suppose that's another thing that they differ in. Interestingly enough, experience points for each of the weapons is tracked separately and they all can be upgraded several times, raising their damage, range and fire rate. Oh, and as you go through the game, at later stages you'll be able to unlock a new third character that has all his weapons already upgraded. The levels are rather large and while they mostly consist of running from left to right, they're a bit uneven, meaning the first few do not impress too much and I could risk saying that they're borderline boring at times, while the latter ones are much better, more fun designed. Can still hunt hold the candle to gunstar heroes though? I think that saying no would not only be fair to Sega's classic but also correct. So no, it cannot. But it doesn't mean that it's a bad game, because it's also not. It's just Korean, which is the main factor why it wasn't more popular and haven't reached wider fanbase in the West, I think. Graphics, musics and sounds are all excellent, and while they may not be the absolute best PCs could do in 1996, they're all definitely pleasant and well fitting to the gameplay. So, to summarize, if you like shooters and action games, Steel Hunt is something definitely worth your time. If you don't, then give it a go anyway, perhaps it's your first. After all, what do you have to lose? Just a few minutes at most. Stalker is a top-down arcade flip screen racer and also a port from the arcades. You could say that same as earlier mentioned Rally K, it's maze based in its design, but it plays entirely different and does not take place in a maze per se, but rather its screens when put together form a maze of roads. Anyway, your task is to race from coast to coast, from Florida to California via freeways. It's another game where there's fuel, so that's fun, and given that your full tank lasts you only 90 seconds, every time you find yourself near a gas station, make sure to refuel. As you race along, you'll drive over various different road features like bridges, side routes, country roads and even off-road to cut corners so to speak. While you'll meet other racers and will have very limited traffic to deal with, they're hardly a problem. Police, on the other hand, definitely is, and they can issue speeding tickets, collecting certain number of, and your game. 
so they are best avoided by any means necessary. Stalker's presentation is quite simple and the gameplay design is also not too creative, but for short bursts every now and then, when you can't decide what to play next, it's a great little palette cleaner between other, better games. Text there, which I no doubt mispronounced here terribly, is a futuristic, always scrolling action shooter platformer, in which you play as a huge mech that can instantly switch into a jet and vice versa whenever necessary gameplay or exploration wise. Texter's gameplay loop is very simple to explain, there's 16 levels that you have to go through and you need to annihilate anything and everything that stands in your way, period. No tragic accident that led you to it, no country to save or evil villain to defeat. Nothing. At least nothing I would have known of. It's not an easy game though and will more often than not put you in a spot where you'd need to react fast and run or fly away to avoid distraction. And all because of the auto-aim feature. It would be amazing if it worked on the closest to farthest bases, shooting at the closest enemies first and then those far off later. Instead, it targets the topmost one and when it's killed it drops to the one below and so on until all are dead. And since these often come in groups, it's not unusual for those lower to be closer to you than those above. Even worse, the auto-aim does not aim at the enemies below you. It's rather annoying, but not game-breaking in any shape or form, and only adds to the already quite steep difficulty curve. Especially that you're bound to find yourself in a situation where there's literally dozens of enemies on the screen at once, all going straight for you. And it's why it's best that you learn and master kiting fast, so pulling away from a group of enemies as a jet, changing into mech, killing a few, changing back, flying away again, changing once more to shoot, time after time until all are defeated. It may seem like a chore to some, but for me it's a part of the charm of this game. Also, I have a history of playing MMOs, so I'm used to the idea of kiting whenever the tank dies. A bit of topic, but explains why I don't mind the mechanic. I honestly don't know what the story of text there is, what's your motivation to kill all those enemies, but it's not something you'll get time to ponder about when playing. What you will though is why there's no ending if you ever beat the game, because after completing the last stage it just restarts from level 2, which given its difficulty is rather disappointing. A short animation and a wall of text would be much better than this. But that's me, perhaps you won't mind. Tipi's Adventure is a Korean arcade action platformer. As you probably have guessed, you play as Tipi, a young mighty warrior who's lost his fiancé to the evil red dragon that's ruling the land with brutal and unconquered force. So, naturally, you take it upon yourself to end his reign and kill it. The game is composed out of six rather large levels that you have to complete before going for the villain. They are filled with various different bodies, which I must add are more often than not very uniquely designed and fun to dispose of, like a walking headless body. Was there a reason for such an enemy to exist? Perhaps not, but I'm glad that it does as it's unusual and something different than what we're used to in the western video games. Since we already somehow landed on the presentation, it's excellent. All the characters, yours and enemies alike are beautifully designed and animated super smoothly, making Tippy's adventure a pleasure to go through. Bosses are all different and have unique attack patterns and are fun to battle against and even more so to put down. If there's one thing I don't particularly enjoy about how the game looks though, and it's a very minor complaint, not reflecting on the overall quality of the game, it's the shots from some of the wall-mounted traps. They shoot a projectile that looks like a green line a pixel or two in height at most, and it's very difficult to distinguish from the background in this fast-moving game. It's not a big issue as you have a health bar and don't get killed by a single hit only, but it's a little annoying nonetheless. Other than that, the game looks fantastic, sounds and music are both good too, perhaps not on the same level as the graphics, but definitely not below industry standard for 1997. There are colored doors in the levels, and they obviously require you to find appropriately colored keys to access, so that's your little bit of exploration puzzling too. Perhaps not much, but you'll be having so much fun playing tippies that you'll hardly notice that it's just a straight up action platformer and not something bigger and more demanding. There's no saves or passwords, so each playthrough starts from the very beginning of the game. A rather unusual choice for 1997 on a home system, but definitely not something to discourage from playing. If there's one arcade game in this video that deserved to be more well known and popular than it was, Tippy's Adventure is the one. Superhero League of Hoboken is a humorous role-playing adventure hybrid and one of the weirdest games I've ever seen in this already unusual mix of genres. A very good one, to be clear, and not weird because it's bad, broken or unplayable. Anyway, the northeastern United States is reduced to post-apocalyptic toxic wasteland and your Crimson Tape, an excellent name for a vigilante I must add, a leader of a group of superheroes. I'm Batman. No, no man bats in this one, Bruce. Toxic pollution and numerous wars have reduced the US to dangerous badlands filled with mutants and other generic comic book villains, with occasional city-states serving as beacons of hope and civilization in these otherwise wild wastelands. 
you will have to complete increasingly more difficult missions assigned by the so-called Commissioner to eventually face and defeat evil Dr. Entropy, the main body of the game. Your superhero power is the ability to create organizational charts. Yes, you heard that right. And as you progress through the game, more heroes with equally as hilarious powers will join your team. And some of these are really something else, like the ability to see through pizza boxes or aura of lethargy and dullness that can instantly put many opponents to sleep, kinda like my voice does. Not to mention fun favorite Iron Tummy, whose uncanny skill allows him to eat any kind of spicy foods without any intestinal distress. I mean, no curries, chilies or ghost peppers can stand in the man's way. He's so cool. You can have up to 9 heroes in your team and completing missions will reward experience points which in turn will let you level them up, raising their powers and skills considerably. Overworld traversal takes place in a top-down view and combat encounters play out in first-person turn-based mode. Superhero League of Hoboken is honestly one of the most original and unique games of the 90s and all fans of RPGs should do themselves a huge favor and give it a go, cause it's probably one of the best sleeper games that they've never heard of. Trojan is a futuristic side view flick screen action beat em up. It's also a port from the arcades for better or worse. In the not so far off future, the world was conquered by the evil warlord Achilles and his henchmen. Yes, like the mythological Achilles. You play as Ryu, same as one from Street Fighter, but you're not unarmed and have a sword and shield to overthrow the evil ruler. So you're actually appropriately armed to the game's post-apocalyptic vision of the future. And while the sword is an important tool in bringing death and destruction to countless generic looking enemies, it's the shield that's your most useful asset. And using it will not only be a good practice, but also mandatory for survival to be able to complete the game. The six levels Trojans built of all consist of mid and end level bosses, and without the shield some of the bosses attacks can one hit you. So better get used to using it often. If that wasn't enough, you're not only gonna have to master the use of the shield, but also a prompt follow up attack, as you're also working against a constantly ticking down clock. Trojan is not an easy game, and will definitely take quite a few attempts before you complete it. Luckily it's actually pretty fun, if you can overlook its presentation today that is. And I mean both, sounds and graphics. And same as in most other Capcom titles, to see the ending you'll have to complete it twice. Weird choice for the PC game, but whatever, it is what it is. If you don't mind difficult arcade games, Trojans as good as they come and an easy addition to your DOS collection. But if you do, then best play something else really. Ultimate Disappointment, I mean Ultimate Body Blows is Body Blows and Body Blows Galactic combined in one game and consists of all characters and stages found in the earlier titles. And while it was well known and for whatever unexplainable reason popular title on the Amiga, it's virtually unknown on PC, which is good, cause it's crap. And yes, I hadn't loved the Amiga before I owned a PC, but I don't subscribe to the notion of liking something just because everyone else does. While UBB, which I will call it that for the rest of its on-screen time, is the best version of the game out there, it's still not good whatsoever. But let's start with what it actually is. It's a 2D versus fighting game that for a long time was an Amiga exclusive and also widely and wrongly considered to be the best fighter on the system. It features 22 fighters from both original games, all the stages and music, but most of all, all the design choices that made the original such a terrible, awful and unplayable title. Namely, everything other than the presentation, which is quite good actually. Both sound and graphics are decent, first is appropriately oomphy, especially with a very enjoyable sound clip whenever a character hits the floor, not very realistic but feels great to hear it whenever it's not you who's knocked down, and graphics, as you can see, are colorful, detailed and very unique as compared to other games in the genre on PC. Attack animations however feel like they could use few extra frames each to be tad smoother. But other than that, there's nothing to complain when it comes to UBB's presentation. Sadly, it's the gameplay where it all falls apart. Unlike Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat or any countless of their clones, UBB gives you one button for controls. Clearly a leftover from Amiga original, but definitely something PC users were not used to. Fortunately, and yes, that's sarcasm, other than the six or so standard moves that the characters have, each of them has only one special. Yes, you heard that right. One. Sure, given how every character looks different, their standard attacks are mostly different from one another, but they're all your standard high, mid and low attacks, and a couple more maybe. A single special move is definitely not enough. If that wasn't enough, the balancing is basically non-existent in UBB, some characters are obviously much worse than others, and I can't imagine anyone finding the inner strength to complete this stinker in a single player mode. 
it's just not fun at all and it's not worth your time, effort and nerves. In multiplayer, it's that better, especially if both players don't know any of the fighters and won't pick the best ones each fight, but it hardly ever offers any more than two free encounters worth of entertainment anyway. UBB on PC was hella obscure. And good, cause it's one game that's actually well worth being forgotten. Shame on you Team 17. World of Aiden Thunderscape is a 3D dungeon crawling role-playing based on the fantasy books trilogy of the same name. The game starts in a very interesting time for Aiden. Not only it is going through a rapid technological revolution moving from sword and sorcery towards flintlocks and muskets, thanks to advances in industrial manufacturing and invention of the steam engine, but it's also suffering from the effects of the so-called dark fog, an event causing demons or nocturnals as they're commonly called to enter the world and cause chaos. Even more so, some of the inhabitants of the land turn corrupted after going into a dark deal with the forces of Darkfall in exchange for power or out of fear and inability to resist them. Only the toughest, strongest and bravest of adventurers can muster a courage to enter the dark underground from within which the evil forces emerge and where they lay in their stronghold. You get that, I mean you, right? You're the one to do it. So you start by creating your party of up to six characters, picking from both traditional, like dwarves, elves and human races, and also unique ones to the game's lore. Then you choose the classes and skills and head off onto your adventure. Interestingly enough, all characters can learn magic and develop their weapon skills regardless of the class choices. It may seem confusing at first, but in reality it gives you much more freedom in customizing how you'd like your party to develop over the span of your quest. Both exploration and combat takes place on the same first-person perspective view screen, but the combat plays out in turns. It's nicely animated and rather robust, so if you like a lot of choice in your fights in RPGs, World of Aiden will definitely not disappoint. One thing worth highlighting is the auto map, which is very detailed, holds information on doors and enemies found and can be zoomed in and out and rotated. It may not sound like a lot, but it's very useful and you'll be using it all the time. First area you start in is sorta introductory and will teach you gameplay mechanics. It holds a shop where you can sell items collected during exploration and will allow you to familiarize yourself with games in their workings and team. When it's completed, the real game starts. And it's rather fun, I must add, but only if you're willing to overlook the presentation that's just terrible. The sounds are loud and pretty low quality and interfere with quite good CD soundtrack and graphics. I dare you to tell me with the straight face that you can recognize all the enemies that you encounter. To me, many of them look like brown mush on even more brown backgrounds. At least the 3D engine is pretty decent and doesn't disappoint. All in all, if presentation is not the most important thing for you, then there's a lot to like here. And Thunderscape may be worth your time. Uncharted Waters is a sailing and trading simulation taking place during the Age of Discovery and it was really popular on the consoles in the East in the early 90s. Not as much on PC, where it remained largely unknown. You play as Leon Franco, a young Portuguese noble who aims to restore his family's former glory by amassing riches and even more so to gain favor and eventually heart of Lady Christiana. That said, the plot while present in the game is merely a background as Uncharted Waters is really an open-ended title. You start with a small ship, trustworthy first mate and a small group of sailors ready to conquer the seas. Your main fear in the game, if you decide to play it as the story suggests, will be traveling between countless known and undiscovered locations, trading goods and investing in neutral ports, expanding your sphere of influence. From time to time, you'll be asked by another merchant or royalty to perform additional tasks, which more often than not are worth completing. Same as in most other thematically similar games to Sid Meier's Pirates, you have to make sure to keep your crew fed and with access to water and your ship or eventually ships in tip-top condition. Hunting for information in pubs and gambling is also a thing, so there's that too. But you don't have to do that all. You can completely ignore all I said to this point and become a pirate, a swashbuckler, a scourge of the seas. You fight like a dairy farmer. How appropriate, you fight like a cow. Raiding other ships and plundering them for riches, you can privateer or you can not do that either and focus on treasure hunting. Because why the hell not? The possibilities are near limitless. The game in most part is played from the top-down view, kinda like aforementioned pirates and it also idolizes the era to build an atmosphere of adventuring rather than showing its darker grim sides. Uncharted Waters is fantastic and if you liked Sid Meier's classic, you cannot just ignore this one and have to give it a go, as it may become your next favorite retro game, even if just for a week or two. Veil of Darkness is a horror isometric action-based role-playing with some adventure elements. The vampire Cain took over control of the valley and the village laying within, cutting it off from the outside world. 
he effectively became its only ruler. He's torturing the villagers, feeding off of them, and turning local women in his posse of vampires servants. He's not only the evil hanging over the poor village though, zombies and werewolves also roam the area, making the already miserable lives of the villagers a nightmare. You're a cargo plane pilot whose plane is mysteriously shot down when flying over the valley and crash lands within it. The reason for it is unknown, but also irrelevant. You're in the middle of nowhere and you'll have to find a way to leave. You are rescued by Deidre, a village girl, who takes you to her father that in turn proclaims you a foretold savior who will free the valley from the Cairn's grasp. And since the valley is cut off from the outside world, the only way to escape is actually through Cairn himself. By killing him, that is. So, you'll spend most of your time exploring the valley, meeting characters, gathering information and finding various objects. Most puzzles are either conversation or inventory based, the environmental puzzling is rather limited. Interestingly enough, not all weapons work as well on all enemies, so finding what's best against which creature and then switching to this during encounters is a must, and also puzzles on their own. Well, at least till you figure out all of them and know the pairings by heart. Until then, it's fun because it keeps the gameplay fresh. The main highlight of Veil of Darkness, however, is the story and atmosphere. First, it's deep, engaging and will keep you on the edge of your seat throughout the whole game, especially that twists and turns are plenty and your current ally may end up stabbing you in the back later on. And the other is dark, grim and scary, well fitting to the plot. Other than the few select main quests that need to be completed in a certain order, most of the game is open-ended and the side quest can be attempted in any order. One thing that not everyone may enjoy and may even discourage some from playing is that Veil of Darkness seems to be unsure what it wants to be. It is an adventure role-playing mixture, but it doesn't really mix them evenly and seems to jump between them, never fully committing to either. Vigilance on Talos 5 is an always scrolling side view action platformer, or dare I say it, Metroidvania like shareware game. I did, I dared, because I have a man butt here and I'm not afraid of anything. It is also partly taken, I mean like the movie with Liam Neeson, but in space and in game format. Kinda. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Your five-year-old daughter Colise has been kidnapped by the evil aliens known as Xenos, and you, Kilian Jarrah, a space mercenary, do not wait to learn what they want for her release, you gear up, suit up and go straight for the military bases. She's bound to be in one, right? And if I ever played an action platformer with a story, and I have, I can pretty much guarantee that she's in the last one. Anyway, like I said, you plow through free military installations to save your daughter and kill Drector, Xenos' leader whose mistake of kidnapping your kin was the second to last that he'd made before getting killed eventually. The last was not shooting himself, as you're gonna give him hell for what he did and it's not gonna be as fast and painless. Vigilance's design is rather standard for the games in the genre, the gameplay loop is pretty fun and running around exploring rather large levels, picking up new weapons and laying destruction all around is not something that gets old fast. Interestingly enough, not all aliens are made the same, some are peaceful and will often offer advice on where to go next and what to do. Obviously, you don't kill those, cause while you're not gonna spare lives of those that are evil, you will also not harm the innocent. You are, after all, a universal superhero, a warrior of justice, savior of the galaxy, in real life, not in the game only. Anyway, presentation-wise, Vigilance on Talos 5 is awesome. The music, sounds and even voice acting, which you won't hear here sadly, are excellent and definitely top class for 1996, and even more so for a shareware game. Graphics are also nicely detailed, colorful and way beyond what you'd expect from the game that did not have a standard release method. All of that, however, was not free and came at a price. This time, a literal price. Vigilance on Talos 5 sold for close to $40, which was nearly twice as much as most other shareware titles went for. And this loan, I fear, may have been the reason for its obscurity. That was years ago though, so if you get a chance to check it out today, do so, as it's worth it. Warriors of Legend is the last of synergistic software's role-playing games made with the World Builder engine. The very same engine that powered likes of Conan the Cimmerian and many other games. The engine that's as unique as it is clunky. It features a top-down view for a world traversal between the distant locations and a close-up side view for when you're in towns and for close quarter battles. It's also so characteristic that you can easily recognize a game made with it in a second if you ever played one before. Its unique, iconic presentation is so instantly distinguishable from anything else that I feel that anyone ever liking one of the games made with it will love them all. The Coven of Evil Sorceress from Lortai, known only as the Black Circle, has raided the peaceful kingdom of Lemuria. King Osric the Great, an ironic name given the state of his kingdom, who's one of the very few survivors of the Black Circle's raid, pled to all the remaining warriors in the country to take upon themselves to rescue the kingdom. This is where you step in. 
starting with a group of four primate adventurers you venture off on a quest to save your homeland from clutches of evil. The world of Lemuria is beautiful, vibrant and richly populated even if overtaken by evil. Towns, dungeons and forests are all around and there's plenty of NPCs to interact with. It offers quite a few side quests too, so you'll be able to immerse yourself in it even more. And won't have to stick to only following the main plot. Sadly, both character customization and combat are rather simple as compared to other games in the genre, which is not an issue in its own right, but feels like a missed chance to add more depth and perhaps even elevate the game to become something bigger, better and more well known. It was not to be though, so perhaps it was a factor in its obscurity. Presentation is pretty good, both in sounds and graphics department, but also not something we've not seen in other games already. So while Warriors of Legend may not be game of scope of Ultima 7 or Daggerfall in any of its aspects, it's still fun and engaging title nonetheless, and a treat to all fans of RPGs. War Wizard is a shareware fantasy top-down turn-based role-playing. My god, it's a mouthful. It was designed, developed and after not being able to secure a publisher, also published by the duo of Brad McQuaid and Steve Clover. And if the names sound at all familiar to you, then your memory is much better than mine. But to not leave you hanging if it's as quote unquote as good as mine is, they were hired by Sony a bit later on to work in their brand new studio on a little game known as EverQuest. Yeah, that MMO legend EverQuest. War Wizard, while looking rather basic, is a full-fledged RPG, featuring a large and interesting continent built out of six kingdoms, Aladdin, Crane, Kara, Esea, Zebesk and Terwan. Great tactical combat system and robust and deep underlying economy. Ages ago the king of Terwan wanted to conquer the whole continent by allying himself with the demons from another dimension. All the opposing good forces joined together and with sacred monk's help trained the very first war wizard. Warrior capable of mastering both weapons and magic. All races then pulled together and proceeded to arm him with highest quality artifact gear. His task was to challenge the king of Terwan which he did and in the process of their dueling both died from fatal wounds. The artifacts were looted and are now scattered around unknown regions of the continent. Eons later Kingdom of Aladdin is conquered by the dark forces and various monsters emerge seemingly out of nowhere and terrorize the lands. A young war wizard apprentice must head off to find all nine artifacts to defeat this new threat. This is where you jump in, taking control of said hero in the making. While you can use all weapons and cast all spells that you learn, companions that you will eventually acquire all have their classes and class limited abilities. The game is played in turns and follows all the usual role playing tropes of finding and talking to characters, exploration, fulfilling quests, arming a war wizard and companions, selling loot and buying gear and so on and so on and so on. Combat is also played out in turns, it's very tactical and grid based and uses action points, which you have a certain number of and they can be stent on movement, melee and ranged attacks, casting spells and using items. Even more so, each part of the body has their own hit points, so if your head or torso goes down to zero, you die. Other extremities at zero render you disabled, and same goes for all enemies, big or small. Obviously each body part can be individually targeted, allowing for a very deep and strategic combat tactics. There's day and night cycle in War Wizard, and you have to make sure that characters eat and sleep to be in tip top form. What I'm trying to telegraph here is that War Wizard is a much bigger, better and advanced game than it looks judging by the surface and it's really surprising that it wasn't as popular as it should have been. Probably because it was released as shareware, probably because of its nice but rather simple presentation or probably because of something else. We will never know. After untimely and unexpected death of the good king Meldiron, Kingdom of Vorterra has been declining rapidly, both socially, with citizens not grasping fully king's premature demise to a rare disease and worrying what will become of the once peaceful kingdom, and also, more importantly, because of the monsters massively creeping seemingly out of nowhere causing terror and mayhem. It seems to be the theme of today's video, isn't it? Magical and terrifying monsters coming from an unknown location and spreading panic and destruction. Odd. Anyway, if that wasn't enough, plague and disease seem to decimate the populace left and right too, caused by unknown force, natural or otherwise. Death, panic and destruction is all that fills days of innocence who cannot understand the sudden transformation of one's idle lands. But amid all that, therein lies a prophecy, written in the ancient book of heralds. It speaks of this precise situation, of death, despair and faithlessness of the world. But most importantly, it's a prophecy about one of royal blood who will find mythical rainbow egg, deliver it to sacred altar room in the great castle and from then onward he will bring the peace and prosperity to Vorterra once more. He will be the next great ruler. You play as one of the knights of the table. Yup, not round table, just table. And I like to imagine here one of those cheap outside wooden tables covered with a single layer of fading, chipping of paint and alcohol stains that you can often find on the terraces of rundown pubs. 
Volterra is a very simple top-down fantasy role-playing that will see you traveling the land searching for said rainbow egg, leaving no stone or tombstone unturned, seeking for hints and directions by talking to common folk and fighting monsters. It may not be the most sophisticated, deep or even fun RPG of them all, but it's definitely one of the more obscure ones. So much so that there's no footage for it anywhere. And also why I'm showering you with screenshots here. So if you'd like to try the game that hardly anyone has ever played, that's the one to track down. Wyberm is a simple action role-playing platformer hybrid with much more emphasis on action and several different gameplay modes rather than the very, very, very basic RPG elements. You play as a bipedal robot that can transform into a tank or a flying spacecraft, kinda like the one in text that we spoke about in previous video. You run around, or travel around I should say really, as you have multiple forms, so you swoop around several large locations, each containing around 10 buildings that can be explored, and as you go about it, you defeat various kinds of enemies collecting power units, which for the most part work kinda like XP and erase your fighting power. You've three kinds of weapons to choose from, with upgrades available upon exploration of new areas. Every now and then you'll encounter an enemy that is considerably stronger than you and you'll have to leave its area to grind on weaker mobs to gain enough power to be able to face it later on. All levels and with boss fights and these take place on separate top-down areas. These two, if too difficult, can be abandoned and returned to later after powering up. To summarize, Wybarm is a game of freeze. Why? Because everything in it seems to be based on the number. There are three viewpoints depending on the location within the game that you're in. So, side view, top down and 3D. There are three forms you can morph into, tank, spacecraft and robot. And finally, three weapons. Wybarm may not seem like anything special being as simple as it is, but it's surprisingly fun. West Phaser is a first-person arcade shooter conceptually similar to Operation Wolf and the game that released twice. First in 1989 and then three years later again under a new and reworked title of Steve McQueen's West Phaser, which is odd as it had literally nothing to do with any of his movies. Why was it re-released then you may wonder? Well, originally it dropped with dedicated hardware, a light gun in the form of a Colt revolver that while cool looking was required for playing. But since the sales were not satisfactory in the slightest, the game was remade to be usable with other input devices. Up to six players can play West Phaser and they're going for the bounties for the most famous western bodies. Likes of Jesse James, Billy the Kid or Bell Star to name a few. Also, incredible names for adult movies actors and actresses. So you're chasing the famous outlaws, but before you'll be able to challenge them, you always have to clear the screen of several waves of generic but humorously depicted western-themed bodies. They're bandits, cowboys and Indians among others. All going after you, the same way you go after them. Your life is represented by the burning candle, so you gotta be quick and accurate not to have it burn out too quick. That said, hitting all of the enemies as they appear, often all at once, is impossible. So it's more of a game of minimizing hits sustained rather than avoiding them altogether. Especially that not everything that moves is there to kill you. For whatever the reason, during the single biggest and deadliest shootout of the West, which any shootout would be if you're involved, I must add, there's like literally dozens of civilian innocents going about their business, their daily life, seemingly not noticing the bullets flying left and right, just following their daily schedules. Odd. But that's the 80s game logic for you. Other than DOS and lowly 8-bit Amstrad CPC, West Phaser also came out on Atari ST and Amiga. And oh my days, if you have a choice or any saying in what version to get, get the Amiga. Or Atari if the other one is not available. They are both like generation or two ahead in presentation when compared to DOS. And I don't have to tell you that it's really disappointing. World Rally Fever Born on the Road is probably the single longest named arcade racing game in existence. Probably. I don't feel like checking and Batman's in the toilet dropping bat nuggets into the bat throne so he can't lend me his world's greatest detective detecting skills to figure it out. So let's assume that I'm correct. WRF has very basic controls, no realistic physics whatsoever, and the emphasis dial is turned all the way towards fast and frantic arcade racing. You pick one of eight entirely unique drivers, each with their own skills and vehicles, and each representing a different preset of speed, acceleration, steering, grip and jump height. Cause yeah, you can jump in World Rally Fever, over road hazards or other racers. The tournaments are held in different parts of the world, French countryside, New York freeways and urban Tokyo among others, and each of them feature different surface conditions and obstacles. This can be rocks, trees, houses, spectators and others. All that combined provides for a lot of fun variety while racing. World Rally Fever features a lot of pickups too, and this can be traps and bombs among others. It's fast and furious, like the movies but better, and keeps you on the edge of your seat all throughout the races, barely giving you time to catch your breath. It's just fantastic. Like Mario Kart, but better? No, different. Yes, different seems more appropriate. 
The racing is super smooth, easily hitting 60 FPS on faster systems, and the graphics complement the hectic snake-like turns with barrage of beautiful images that you pass by. For the most part, all stages are amazing, though in some oddities prevail, like multiple Statues of Liberty in New York, for instance. It doesn't detract from playing in any way, really, but does take you out of experience for a second or so. Sounds and music are really good, too, and while tunes are not something to hum for hours on end after playing, they don't feel out of place whatsoever. World Rally Fever excels among other arcade races that drop the realism for fast and fun arcade gameplay, as it scores the hat-trick of gaming. It sounds, looks, and most importantly, plays great. Check it out. ZUG aka The Journey to the West is a typical Eastern themed side scrolling beat em up. Panda Games, the developer, was one of the very few at the time that exclusively released those arcade like games on PC only, and whichever game of theirs you had a chance to come across, you could always count on a quality title. Not necessarily genre defining, but always very close in scope to what was available on popular consoles at the time. ZUG is a typical walk left to right and beat everything up type of a game, occasionally challenging you with the bosses. And as such, it works like a charm. You don't need any special strategies to it, you just carry on mashing anyone that stands in your way. There's quite a few different types of enemies, all of them made out of big, nicely animated and uniquely looking sprites. You, or you and a friend, can play as one of three available fighters. Two of them are anthropomorphic mythical animals, Sun Wukong the Monkey King and Zubajie the Pig. The last is human, Xiao Wu Jing, and all we know of him is that he's a hard-working man. And if that isn't the weirdest combination of playable characters in action game, then I don't know what is. That said, they provide for a lot of variety if you want to complete the game more than once, as each plays entirely different and has a set of uniquely looking moves. They are equally as strong, however, so you should never really need to argue about playing as a particular same and strongest of them all fighter, cause there isn't one. And as per usual in arcade-like brawlers, each of the fighters have their own super attack that dissolve large clusters of enemies with ease, but also cost you a little bit of your life, so they're to be used in only the direst of situations. The Journey to the West only ever came out in Chinese. Now, that's not a big issue if you keep in mind what it is and how it's played, as stories in beat em ups are hardly anything worth learning. But if you care about this, then it's something that you're not going to learn in game. It sort of loosely follows the original Journey to the West story, so you could treat it as such, but it's not one to one, so yeah. If you grew up when arcades were the place to be, or even a bit later, when arcade games were what everyone wanted to play conversions of on the home systems, then you're gonna love ZUG. If not, then, well, you best check it out and decide for yourself. Zephos is a sci-fi space first-person simulation shooter. I know, sounds convoluted, but imagine Ian Bell's classic elite and just remove all the death from it and expand on space combat, and you'll end up with Zephos. Story-wise, civil war broke out in Zephos system that's composed out of six universes, five known and one hidden, or locked away by the rogue AI, I should say really. And you must explore the known five, keeping good relations with both sides of the conflict, and look for the sixth central universe in search for the cause of the conflict. For the most part, the game play is rather non-linear and open-ended, so you'll be able to fly around wherever you please provided you know how to get there and have enough fuel. And that's also what you'll be mainly doing. Flying around the remote space locations, trading to earn enough to keep your ship refueled and upgraded, and dogfighting buddies. And the latter you'll be doing a lot of. Close to like 90% of the game is flying and shooting, which you know, while not being as deep as Elite's different inner intertwined mechanisms, is not bad either, as it's definitely the best part of this game. The more you do that though, the smarter the enemies will be and the bigger the packs that they attack in, but other than that they will not change much all throughout the game. So if you're someone who gets bored easily, then the lack of new mechanics after a couple of hours or so of playing will definitely bother you a bit. Fortunately, occasional asteroid fields or space mines provide enough distraction to keep you entertained a bit longer. So even if not all the way to the end, Xiphos definitely can provide few hours of fun. Especially that there's literally hundreds of locations that you can visit, and the completionist in some of us won't stop until they visit them all. Not me, mind you, but I know a few. Oh, and it's worth noting that even saving the game costs in-game credits, so make sure to always have plenty enough for a save and not spend them all in one go. While Xiphos may not have a scope of a lead, it placed all its bets on action and good, cause that's what it does well, and ended up being a fun, even if a bit repeatable space opera fair. If you like those, then you'll love it. If you don't, then it's not gonna sway your opinion about them.
Blade Warrior aka Zykland is another of those games that never reached the limelight because of it being distributed as shareware. It's also an anime style side scrolling action platformer. It is set in a dystopian future of 2002. Yeah, you heard that right, dystopian future of 21 years ago. The unforeseen rise of incurable diseases and huge increase in drug use and criminal activities are plaguing the society. It's a future when cyborgs are omnipresent, advanced and sentient. The authorities, however, do not give them the same rights as humans get. Treated as subpar citizens, they often turn to criminal organizations, join them as foot soldiers in battle against the establishment. You play as a member of the titular Zykland, secret government-founded mercenaries composed mainly of retired and discredited soldiers sent on the most dangerous and crucial missions. You start with a task of dealing with a gang of marauding cyborgs. It is, however, just the beginning of much bigger and much more dangerous campaign. Zykland is a typical linear action platformer in which you go through each stage defeating what feels like football stadiums worth of enemies. Most of them are cyborgs, robots and, and various other machines. You can progress to the next stage only after defeating all enemies on the one that you're currently on, and to do so you're armed with a sword and sword only, at least initially. And while it may not seem like a lot, Blade Warrior is a game based heavily in the anime tropes and henceforth the sword is the deadliest weapon out there. Also enough to lay death and destruction to everything around you. You are, after all, a mysterious warrior of mythical origin. All that said, you do get access to some ranged weapons in limited numbers, they can be found in some stages. The biggest highlight of the game, however, is definitely its presentation, which by 1995 may have not wooed anyone, but today, years later, it looks great. I know what I said. Its 2D pixel graphics aged very nicely indeed. The sprites are large, beautifully animated, especially the bosses that often have multiple joints to them, but the special effects and backgrounds are also pretty impressive. Overall, the game looks nice, plays well and should have reached much higher popularity than it did. Definitely check it out. Some of you may recognize Vermeer from my earlier videos, specifically 10 years of Amiga, DOS and C64 gaming series, or perhaps even its separate review on my channel. And yeah, that's the same game. But the fact that I spoke about it before and love it to bits doesn't mean that it's not an obscure game. I just wasted a lot of time playing it. It's also an excellent example of a hidden gem, because hardly anyone outside of Germany knows about it. Vermeer is the only game that I ever mastered, understood and played to death over the last few decades that's not in English. In fact, it's in German only, and I don't speak German. I'd like to, but I don't. I mean, I can say Gebraten and Mitapfel, so a baked duck with apples, or even Welche Grosse Tragen Sie, which is roughly something down the lines of what size are you wearing. But other than these two and a couple of other random sentences, my understanding of the language is non-existent. I do, however, know where and how to do everything in Vermeer. I've figured everything out in it, every nook, cranny and inner mechanic, all the while being a little kid and playing it on my C64 years ago. And since it's a fictional business management game in a foreign to me language, touching a very uncommon subject of running plantations, art collecting and stock trading, so hardly anything action-packed, it's all gotta speak to the game's quality. Especially if a few years old kid did whatever he could to grasp it in full, right? And all that, mind you, without ever learning the language. Anyway, to summarize it in short, Vermeer is a unique fictional trading simulation that takes place in the 1920s. And while it's not overly complicated, if you really get into it, it is surprisingly addictive. The main goal of the game is to use 50,000 marks that you inherited from your dying uncle to recover his stolen collection of works of art. To do that, however, you have to amass much more money than the measly 50,000. And this is where the plant cultivation, plantations, stocks, bonds and art comes in. You'll be doing all that to fulfill your goal. Stay afloat and most importantly, to have fun. Oh, and obviously it's a lot more enjoyable when played open-ended, running your own company, getting richer and richer rather than racing to the end. Up to three players can compete in turns, which quite honestly is the best way of experiencing Vermeer, setting up better business deals, traveling around the world and securing the best spots for plantations, leaving your opponents with dry soil. It's great against others. One of my first and rough videos on this channel was a review of Vermeer. So if you'd like to know more about it, I actually go into thoroughly comparing C64 and Amiga ports there. Feature-wise, they're identical and so is this version, but graphically they do differ a bit. All in all, it's an amazing little title, but definitely not a game for everyone. Weird Island is an early shareware point-and-click adventure. I've been complaining about shareware games being less widespread a lot in this series of mine, I know, and that it limited the popularity of some games considerably, that too. But there are also good things about the distribution method, provided that we live in a country that actually did those, that is. 
namely you got to try to sample the game first hand before committing to purchase. And it was very often a much bigger chunk of gameplay than what the popular few years later demos offered. Quite often a third of an entire game, sometimes even half. So, that's plenty enough to figure out if the game was worth your money and also to get you involved in its story and have you want to complete it. Or not, but you had time to make your mind about it, is what I'm saying. Anyway, coming back to our game, centuries ago five galley slaves washed up on a tropical island and one of them was your ancestor. They all settled there permanently and founded five families that by today are the de facto biggest, most prominent and ruling families on it, passing the official ownership of the island between them every 100 years. The game starts just as the ownership is moved to you, with news of it delivered by the solicitors. Weird Island is not a long game, but it's, well, weird, and there's a lot of interesting and silly things that the developer added to it. It is, however, notoriously difficult to complete. There are a few sections in it that may stop you in your tracks if you haven't done something else first, and it's not indicated that it may happen beforehand anywhere. So, if you like adventure games, but are also someone who gets annoyed easily or hates illogical mechanics, make sure to have a walkthrough somewhere within hand's reach, just in case. Now, I've never played Weird Island, but after researching it for this video and reading what people wrote about it, it seems that the very few who actually played it had nothing but good things to say about it. So I'm kinda curious now too. Xenophage Alien Bloodsport is a rather bad 2D versus fighting game that's as brutal and bloody as Mortal Kombat, but nowhere near the quality of it, and featuring in large majority various alien combatants coming from all corners of the universe. Corner of the universe. Pfft, that's stupid. Anyway, all of them are pretty weirdly made, pre-rendered and turned into sprites, moving as stiffly as some of those early 20th century stop-motion videos did. I don't exactly remember the title, but there was this old black and white movie in which two dinosaurs fought and they were stop-motion and looked incredibly unrealistic as the movement was very jerky. Same here, but in full color. If the animations were smooth, a lot could be forgiving and perhaps Xenophage could be an average versus fighter. But, as it is now, it's just awful. Backgrounds surprisingly are actually not that bad, they scroll sideways and could stay as they are if the rest of the game was any better. I mean, they're not in the quality of some of the late pixel-based classics, but they're workable. Interestingly enough, Xenophage uses a very similar scaling technique that was in Samurai Showdown, where the screen zooms in when the characters are close to each other and zooms out when they're apart. And while neatly looking, even if unnecessary gameplay-wise, it's hardly enough to save Xenophage. But if you thought that I finished dumping on the game already, you're mistaken. Because its control scheme is another little nightmare to tackle if you decide to check it out. I'm not sure if it was me, as the last time I played it was years ago, but controls always felt incredibly unresponsive and I'm not sure if I ever managed to pull off any of the special moves. Watching the YouTube footage for the game now, I see that others do, so it's definitely not impossible, but I get the feeling that it may be at the very least challenging. Since I've dropped so many stinking bricks on Xenophage already, let me tell you what's good about it. Because believe it or not, there are a few small things. First of all, blood, gore and guts of various human and alien origins. Sure, it's not as appealing to me today when I'm older, but back then it definitely raised the game score in my eyes a bit. Also the introduction in which the earth explodes and part of it flies off with an intact barn still attached to it. Nothing to do with the gameplay, but a nice fun little touch. And finally, I like that PC Games Magazine gave it a score of 75% in 1996, scoring the game much higher than any other video games journalism outlet did. They either didn't care to play it, or it was worth it to them to go as high. So, I like how bold they were with it. That's it. It's a crap game, don't play it. Or do, if you're a bad games connoisseur, cause this one's definitely a real stinker. Zeiss the Adventure is a Korean platformer. We've covered quite a few Korean games recently, as while their developers were pretty active on the DOS gaming scene, hardly any games reached the Western audiences. So they're perfect match for the obscure series. You play as Zeiss, a young boy who finds a mysterious letter in a bottle with plead for help. So, as you do when someone needs a helping hand, you venture into a magical land of Lysnia to save its citizens from the evil pirate Scourge. The game is composed out of six worlds of three stages each for a total of 18 individual levels. They are arranged in a linear fashion and feature no mid or end level bosses. It doesn't mean that Zeiss is not fun though, as it's actually pretty good and unique, but not mind-blowing, jaw-dropping or so crazy. Is there even a saying like that, that something's so crazy? I don't know. Never mind. You start with a slingshot, which is your default weapon, and while not the most powerful, it works decently against various interestingly designed enemies. Watermelons scattered around the stages award you new costumes, which in turn grant you new weapon abilities. And these all are really different. There's a like a yo-yo which kills most enemies with just one hit, there's the ability to release a swarm of birds and even homing stars attack among others. There's a lot of these, is what I'm saying. You could also collect diamonds, which increase your health, so whenever you see one, pick it up, it's actually worth the effort. 
Other than that, Zeiss features all the standard platforming tropes of searching for keys that open doors, using slides and ropes for between the platform traversal and such. There's few unique things too, like pencils that draw new platforms when activated floating cushions, and many more other unusual additions like a level where you ride a dolphin plane in a shoot'em up style. So, it's varied enough to keep you entertained all throughout. Zeiss's presentation is ok at best, and I would honestly expect a lot more from the far end of 1995, but it is what it is. Sprites are small, a stylistic choice, I get that, but they're an impressive lack detail and their animation is basic and composed out of literally a handful of frames. And the movement and jumps feel a bit floaty. Sounds and music are ok, but also nothing out of ordinary. All in all, Zeiss is a pretty decent platformer. Perhaps not one of the best on the platform, but definitely worth checking out. Zone Raiders is a 3D futuristic vehicular combat game with hover cars. Think Wipeout, but not as good or memorable, hence why you know of the latter and not this. You play as a futuristic scavenger, a raider of sorts, who enters the so-called Free Zone, a dangerous part of the futuristic world, where with a bit of luck a very expensive items can be scavenged. You're not the only one trying to get those, however, so in each of the 16 stages you'll face other raiders doing the same thing you do. So, you'll be trying to avoid getting captured by the zone patrols that are always on your tail, and you'll battle enemy vehicles utilizing various different weapons. Sadly, the game world of Zone Raiders is rather devoid of life. It feels empty, uninspired and designed in a rush just to meet a deadline. Now, that may just be my opinion about it, but nothing in it looks even remotely interesting. Worst of all, all the enemies that you fight are so easy to destroy, you hardly ever feel challenged. They're literally there just to slow you down a little, which is a bit disappointing. At least you get to collect new weapons along the way, so there's that to prolong Zone Raiders' otherwise short stay. But the 8 weapons, 5 different hovercars and 16 trucks is not enough to keep the game entertaining for more than a couple of hours. And it would have been much more appropriate if it was sold as a shareware title at reduced price, rather than the full-fledged release. Presentation-wise, there's nothing really to woo you in Zone Raiders, the use of color is sparse, and I get that it's a grim future, but so is Cyberpunks, and it somehow manages to overflow with color. And finally, all the 3D models are rather simplistic, probably to keep the game running at a decent pace. Sounds and music are ok, but not enough to save this rather below average game. Play or avoid, your call, I'd personally lean towards the latter. Yogo Yogo Spell is a Dutch platformer, and it's entirely in Dutch, so no story here for you as sadly I don't speak the language. But it's a platformer, so who cares. Story is secondary in these two gameplay anyway. Interestingly enough, the game was either supported or financed by the Dutch Yogo Yogo brand of yogurt based drinks, it doesn't really get in the way of playing as they only serve as power ups, and it's also nothing new as we had these types of games before and more often than not they were just fine. I mean you had Lucas 8 in Super Frog, though I would swear it was Lucas 8 Orange judging by the in-game graphics, also Sprite in cool spot and chapa chapa lollipops in zoo. If the ad is not too much in your face, it doesn't influence the game negatively too much, is what I'm saying here. And fortunately, Yoga Yoga Spell is quite fine on its own as a game too. It is played for points and features 6 regular levels and bonus stages between them. In standard levels, you'll usually have to find something and deliver it somewhere or to someone, so for instance in first stage, you're searching for 3 missing spots that the prize winning cow lost, yeah, you heard that right. In second, the sea is emptying, so you have to locate and bring 3 cauliflower pieces says to Betty so that she could resume her work as a plug for the sea, so that it wouldn't lose all its water. Yep, another crazy one. In third, you have to find the kettle full of scorching hot water to unfreeze the door handle to reset the thermostat that's behind it. I'm not gonna list them all here, but they're all very unusual tasks and henceforth make for a quite unique gameplay, at least as compared to most games in the genre. The bonus stages are full of fruits and are there just to help you amass more points, and to work as a sorta of palette cleaner between these very different to one another main tasks. Yago Yago Spell, while not impressive in any shape or form, is actually pretty decent, so if you're on the lookout for a new platformer, it's innovative enough to keep you hooked all the way to the end. I'm sure of it. Zone 66 is a sci-fi top-down always scrolling anime style shooter, and as befits the anime-like games, the drama is dialed to 10 in this one. A mysterious stranger warns you about something terrible that's going to happen in your hometown, so being as superstitious as you are, and since you always should believe what the strangers are saying, note that down kids. Nope, no, 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 don't do that, I retract what I said. I'm Batman! Shut up, Bruce, I know you are. It's not time or place for it now. Yeah, I never meant what I said. Oh, almighty gods of YouTube, please forgive me this silly digression. Anyway, where were we? Ah, yes. 
So having to listen to a stranger, which no one in the right mind should do, you rush home. And there you find your wife and baby daughter murdered. Giving yourself what feels like 3 seconds to grief, you jump back in your ship and head off to avenge them. What you don't realize, however, is that the terrorist forces responsible for your personal nightmare are scheming something even bigger and more evil. That's yet to happen though. And what I don't realize is why is that seemingly so important if you're only on a very personal vendetta? Why would their other plans be of any significance to you? And I will probably never neither know nor understand it as I've never been an 80s or 90s movie action hero. Not that I didn't want to, it was just not in the cards. I mean, who didn't want to be Darth Vader, Predator or Hans Gruber? Wait, did I say hero? Anyway... The game is composed out of 8 levels, between which a little additional story snippets are added, keeping you following it all the way to the end. And even if I find it a tad too dramatic, the game is so good that you'll no doubt learn it all eventually anyway. There's quite a few crafts to choose from, and each of them can be individually armed with numerous different weapons before playing, making for a very customizable experience. You fight against both air and ground units, and the variety of enemies will no doubt keep you entertained. Especially that Zone 66 is super smooth. It is a dictionary definition of smooth gameplay. Don't fact check it, trust me. Everything moves so fluidly that it's a pleasure to witness. Sounds are pretty good too, and music is on another level. And other than the aforementioned smoothness of gameplay, it's a definite highlight of the game. So if you like shooters or even action games at all, it is surely the game from this video to track down and play. Free the Space Fighter is a very late DOS shower vertically scrolling shoot em up. Shower version of the game limited the playtime to 5 minutes only, and while I understand the devs not wanting to give away a third or even a half of the game for free in the shower model, as they used to in the first half of the 90s, 5 minutes is just not enough to try the game out for all. Free the Space Fighter takes place more or less today, and I mean it quite literally, as according to its story it's set in the beginning of the 21st century. We've been trying for so long and we've finally managed to make contact with the alien species. Unfortunately, they're not what we were hoping that they would be. They're quite hostile and much more technologically advanced than we could ever hope to be. Naturally, realizing same thing with it, they attacked and single-handedly removed all our planetary defenses. Our destruction seemed inevitable. Seeing that, world governments did what until then seemed totally impossible and they joined forces, pulled together in the last effort to create a craft capable of withstanding and counterattacking at the alien force. It was codenamed Sigma Terminus. As a tool of our last stand, the craft has been given to Earth's greatest pilot, the hero, the last hope. You, you're the one to pilot it against the alien scourge. Free the Space Fighters gameplay is your typical shoot em up, so you fly up fighting against advancing waves of enemies, attacking you in various patterns. They're quite different from one another and nicely designed, though personally I'm not a big fan of pre rendered graphics. I prefer them to be either pixel based sprites or entirely 3D. That's me though, so don't hold it against the game's quality. Every now and then, spheres containing power ups, shield refills, and ammo for secondary weapons show up, and when destroyed, appropriate bonus drops or pick up. Each level ends with a boss fight and these are, as per usual in shooters, more demanding and by extension of that, more fun encounters than the regular enemies are. You can get hit as many times as your shield can take, but it doesn't refill automatically without pickups. 3D Fighters graphics are in high resolution as VGA and pre-rendered. While I don't care much for them personally, they look aesthetically pleasing if you don't mind them and the sounds are pretty decent too, though nothing special. Overall, 3D Space Fighter is a pretty decent shooter that somehow managed to release under DOS in 1999, and not on Windows as most games did by then. AGE, also known as Advanced Galactic Empire, is a follow-up to earlier Galactic Empire and also a first-person space exploration game. And if on the first glance it seems to you similar to Elite, then good, cause it is, and offers a very comparable relative freedom of traversal. That said, AGE features an overarching plot, which while not necessary to dive into straight away, also kinda gets access to some of the later gameplay concepts, so we'll have to be engaged with at some point whether you want to or not. And as plots in most games go, it's rather linear. But the space itself, its exploration and things you can do in are pretty open and fun. So as in most elite-like games, you can fly around planets and stars, meet and converse with other characters and engage in space combat among others. Graphically, AGE is rather attractive for 1991, and nice VGA vector graphics will be pleasing to most fans of the genre. Especially that accompanying sound effects fit well and the story encompasses the future of the whole universe. AG may not be as open-ended and infinitely replayable as Elite is, but it's a lot of fun nonetheless. Absolute Zero is a sci-fi space first-person shooter. 
Believe it or not, but by 21st century we've colonized a vast chunk of our solar system. The colonies may not be big, but they're self-sustainable, and while by then the space travel may have gotten considerably faster than it is now, and it's much more common, it's still not instantaneous. One of our colonies is on Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. And because of the abundance of water, it's one of the larger ones. One of the moon's mining facilities accidentally discovers long buried underground deep in slumber alien race. Uncovered species awoke as angry as your everyday Karenis and attacked the miners. Soon after, they destroyed moon's capital city. Since potential help from Earth would take a while to arrive, it's up to you to stop the alien menace or at least hold them off till said help shows up. The twist to the usual fare in similar games is that you don't play as a singular character but are placed in control of a different one for each of the missions. And with their collective efforts piloting seven different crafts and stationary combat installations, you will save the remnants of the colony and repel the aliens. I hope. Absolute Zero's story and you having to play as different characters constantly switching between them is a very fresh take on the first person space shooter genre, especially that it very accurately and convincingly portrays collective struggle for survival. It is not without its downsides though and while the gameplay is really enjoyable when you get the hang of it, the entry threshold is quite high, as it's not instantly obvious what and how to do when you start the game if you've not read the manual before. So, either do it or prepare to practice for a while until you master the controls and user interface. As you play the game, the more and more of the story will be unveiled and along with it Alien's genesis and motivations and if you persevere with it all the way to the end, all of it will culminate nicely. Absolute Zero is not a bad game, but it's not as straightforward jumping and play fair as Wing Commander for instance was, so it may be slight discouraging to some. But if you like those story rich space shooters, it's definitely worth giving it a chance. Airstrike is a side view by horizontally scrolling shower shooter in which you control Apache like helicopter. It's also a game that I like to think of as being a poor man's jet strike. It depicts a conflict between fictional North Atlantic Defense Alliance and equally as not real nation of the Snowvia. The game is divided into 21 chained missions which see you partake in peacekeeping activities. And if you wonder what that means, perhaps you're delivering food to the poor, building shelters for bombing victims and the likes, then no, that's totally not it. Peacekeeping in this particular case is a total and final destruction of all opposing enemy forces. So you're running said missions from the aircraft carrier stationed offshore from the Snovia and giving very specific targets for each of them. The enemy forces consist of rocket launcher armed soldiers, AA guns, missile batteries, gunboats and others. And while killing them it's best to make sure not to destroy any civilian structures or even trees, as destruction of these non-military objects adds up to a score penalty upon mission completion. Same goes for your copter. If it's damaged it's worth some negative points. The map wraps around and if you keep flying one way you will end up back at the carrier. So I like to imagine that you're flying literally around the island, otherwise it makes no sense in my head and it bothers me a little. Airstrike's presentation is rather basic, the sounds are very muffled and don't give pleasant feedback to the on-screen action, the music is virtually non-existent and the graphics are disappointing when it comes to both their quality and animation. And I get that only few people worked on Airstrike and that's hardly enough but I would still expect much more by 1995. If you don't have Jet Strike and feel like some side view helicopter action, Airstrike can be fun for a few missions. I I wouldn't expect you to complete it though. Ajax, also known as Typhoon, is a rather average vertically scrolling shoot em up based on arcade original of the same name. Guess what is the background story of Ajax? No, really, guess. Give it a go. Don't be shy. Oh, wait. Did you say aliens invaded Earth again? You did? Great, because that's what happened. I mean, it's not great because it happened, but great because you got it right. And I have the feeling that this third game covering the subject today is not the last. But we'll see. When I record it, it's not necessary when all games are picked for the video yet, so let's see if the past me managed in his own present to pick the game that will not surprise me by being thematically identical to the earlier three in this video and also his now future. I know, you're probably confused now, but imagine being me and living with all those thoughts constantly popping up in your head all day every day. It's as weird feeling as it is tiresome. On the upside though, I hardly ever get bored. Anyway, your objective is that simple, to complete all 8 levels and kill as many of the evil aliens as you can, preferably surviving in the process. You control a copter, again, armed with a cannon and a bomb launcher, and you also have a limited supply of smart bombs, used for clearing large clusters of enemies. And these naturally come at you in predefined and permanent between the playthroughs patterns. So, Ajax is one of those games where memorization is a key to success. 
especially that you will be constantly under fire from both air and ground enemies, and your copter can't really take any serious beating. While the arcade original of Ajax was really fun, impressive looking for the time it released, and one of the best shooters out there, this 1989's PC port is seriously let down by its graphics, which in EGA presentation, and not a good EGA I must add, makes it look bland and run disappointingly choppy. It's not a bad game, don't get me wrong, but it's an average one at best, at least on PC. Alpha Storm is a game that's hard to classify, as on the surface it appears to be just your run-of-the-mill FPS, but it's so much more than that. It's also a spaceship simulation set in a semi-sandbox universe. Basically a Star Trek if all was not good in the universe. And the game is divided into sections. First is your space traversal for which you use your ship that can be equipped with various devices and weapon systems. This can be all sorts of lasers, engines, cloaking devices, radars or even radar jammers among others. And all these come in different class variants so there's a lot here to work towards and change during the course of your adventure. The second section of the game is the first person shooting. Which happens on planetary bases or whenever you take the enemy's ship or space station's shields teleport to them and want to clear them of the enemy forces. Or if you're unlucky, if they board your ship, cause that can happen too. When boarding enemy vessels you can find and steal various pieces of hardware that then can be used on your ship. You know, how you would do in space if no laws applies to you, or if you elected to ignore them. The universe of Alpha Storm is rather large, several dozens of systems in size actually, and they can all be visited. They're not empty, as you would expect them to be as compared to our solar system, but populated by three factions, the Imperials, the Pirates and the Varks. Sadly, for whatever the reason, all of them are hostile against you, so joining any of the factions is out of question. Which is a bit sad and limiting role-playing wise, but not a game breaker. Now, I mentioned that your ship can be boarded too, and same, as you can steal components from the enemy ships, they can steal those from yours too. Even more so, some of the ship's systems can be damaged during combat and will need to be replaced. So keeping your aircraft in tip-top form is a must all throughout the game. While the gameplay is quite fun and unique compared to all the other titles that released in the same time, the story is... Oh my, so um, I don't know. It's bad and illogical, but not so bad that it's good. It's basically just stupid and inconsistent. The evil race of aliens came and wants to eradicate all life in the galaxy, leaving nothing but empty voids where star systems that they attacked were. So you're trying to stop them and to do so you need to find two artifacts, Nova Bomb and Stasis device. And in the same time, while you're seemingly doing it all for good, to save the world and all, you annihilate all the other species that you come across. So perhaps it's you who's the scourge of the universe? In the end, Alpha Storm is fun if you play it for what it is and not focus on the story too much. Annihilator Tank is a shareware tank based 3D action shooter. The game is your near typical wave shooter, meaning that each consecutive wave of enemy tanks that you fight against is in greater and greater numbers, until eventually you finally get to the so called combat unlimited level where the number of enemies is infinite and you fight to stay alive for as long as you can, and not to complete it per se. You locate the enemies using the radar, compass and status bar and other than that there is not much that you need to know about the game. There are some obstacles like trees and such, but all are destructible so provide no realistic cover. In short, kill as many enemy tanks as you can, survive for as long and earn the points. There's four stages in the game, Country Carnage, Wasteland Warriors, Desert Destruction and earlier mentioned Combat Unlimited, but only the first is available in the unregistered shareware version. Presentation wise, there's really not much to annihilate or tank. Sounds are appropriate, can't complain about them really, even if there isn't many more than the shot and explosion and music is non-existent. Graphics are beyond basic and seriously disappointing for 1995, even if they're 3D. It's early 3D though, so it didn't age very well. In the end, Annihilator Tank is not a game to play for hours on end, but if you consider it a fun, simple arcade shooter to use as a palette cleaner between other better games, then it does its job very well. Apocalypse Abyss, a weird title really, is a top-down action puzzler. All the inhabitants of the magical kingdom of Ruidia disappeared seemingly into a thin air. In reality, they were captured and imprisoned by the evil wizard Nietzsche in his fortress in the Blood Mountains. Now, that's a cool name if I ever saw one. The fortress is impenetrable by the traditional means and can only be entered when the magic sealing it is broken. And to do so, five artifacts scattered around its dungeons need to be recovered. And you, playing as Ashtar the Dwarf, are the only one left, and by extension of that, the only one who can collect the artifacts, unlock the fortress, solve wizard's ultimate puzzles, read the world of him, and finally save all of the kingdom's inhabitants. Each of the levels is a puzzle that requires you to complete one objective and one objective alone. Open the exit to the next and go through it. 
but it's never as straightforward as it sounds and you will have to do a lot of tinkering around the various mechanics of the stages by pushing rocks, destroying barriers with bombs and triggering objects with thrown daggers. A nice change, I must add, from all the deaths that are usually triggered with thrown daggers that we've seen in other games. The game is divided into five basic dungeons of ten levels each, and each of the five contains one of the five mystical artifacts that need to be found and collected. And when you get them all, the last and final dungeon unlocks and it leads to evil wizard destruction when completed. Apocalypse Abyss, once again odd title, is a pretty fun game if you happen to like puzzlers, cause the level layouts and mechanics are varied enough to easily entertain you and that brain of yours all the way to the end. But if you don't care for puzzling, it will be annoying and awfully looking game for you, so just skip it, cause the graphics are really, really simple and unimpressive. Sure, it's not important in a puzzler, but if you compare it to earlier games like Pushover, One Step Beyond or even Fury of the Fairies, which arguably is a puzzle platformer and not a straight up puzzler, then Apocalypse Abyss looks like something that was not given a lot of attention. And even if it's not the case whatsoever, it's just not as good as the giants of the genre are. Brahmins, so the two-headed cows found in the Fallout's universe is what I consider to be Apocalypse Cows. They came to be as this terrible and awful looking spawn of evolution and radiation combined over time. In our today's game, it's hardly the case. Apocalypse Cow is a shareware split-screen top-down two-player only arcade title, and all the cows have just one head. A serious overlooking on the developer's site in my books, but whatever. The game of the game is to destroy all the opponent's catapults before he does the same to you. And you do it by, you guessed it right, catapulting cows at them. The Apocalypse Cows. There are three types of these, a regular cow, you know, like the one in Milka commercials, but not purple. Then there is a glass one that destroys two catapults at one go, and the last, metal, destroys three. Other than the cows, there are also other ways you can lose a catapult. And it's by either driving into a cactus, fire or rabbit dogs. Or by being burned by Mr. Sun. I know, sounds silly, but you'll know what I'm talking about when you see him. Or it, really, and not him. And finally, by being eaten by the hungry weasel head. Yep, I know, all I set up to this point seems crazy, to put it mildly, but that's the shareware games for you. You never know what to expect, and it can as easily be a gem as it can be a stinker. And Apocalypse Cow is, well, hard to tell. If you have a friend with you and some drinks were involved, then pretty fun for a little while. If not, then, I don't know, try it out for yourself, man, and let me know. Anyway, all these NPC enemies, other than your opponent, appear on the screen after 3 minutes of playing if no winner is decided by then. You can however extend the timer by additional 15 seconds every time you manage to hit your cow in the green target on the opponent's side. Hitting a red one will upgrade their cow to either glass or metal, so best not to do it. If two cows collide mid-air, a cow boxing minigame is triggered and they fight it out on a cloud. I know, once again, I know it sounds crazy, but bear with me. The losing cow is removed and the winner carries on to its target. There are four differently looking stages in the game and if all I set up to this point seems to you to be very Monty Python-esque, then good, cause it kinda is, just not in a smart as their sketches kind of way, more in an abstract, let's add more weird shit to our game way. Which is not bad either, just requires drinks I mentioned before. Non-alcoholic ones, obviously you drink to stay hydrated after all, right? Right. And I didn't say it all for the YouTube's sake. Asterix Caesar's Challenge is a multiplayer board game based on the cult classic European comic book series about courageous Gauls and their struggle against the Roman forces. Or rather, huge Roman army struggles against a tiny village of Gauls, I should say, really. The game is all about traveling around the board that represents the Roman Empire and learning about the history and culture of various countries. Your goal is to collect souvenirs from all places you visited and then come back to your village in a given time with them as a proof of your accomplishments. Or otherwise, Caesar will win. Whatever that means other than the game over for you. The game board is composed out of 54 fields that you can land on, and they represent different countries, various challenges in form of the minigames, prisons, magic potions, traps, rest and meeting different lore-based characters. To acquire items needed for winning the game, you either have to answer correctly quiz questions asked in the country fields, or purchase them from a Phoenician merchant for gold one in various mostly arcade-like minigames. Asterix Caesar's Challenge is a truly excellent party slash family game that will no doubt appeal to all the fans of the comic books. Especially that you can obviously play as both Asterix and Obelix, the main protagonists of the series, and a few other well-known characters from the books too. Now, naturally, the replayability of the game is rather limited, as after a few complete playthroughs you'll know pretty much most of what it has to offer. But if there are kids at home and you'd like them to both have fun and also learn something, anything, then it's an excellent pick to fire up. Provided you manage to have them stop watching TikTok, that is. 
and it's not that easy these days. Anyway, presentation-wise, Asterix Caesar's challenge is incredible and everything about it is top of the class for the year it released in. The sounds are nicely sampled and the voice acting is high class. And the graphics? Don't get me started on the graphics. All the short animated clips and incredibly detailed drawings make it look as if you were watching an interactive cartoon most of the time. All in all, I cannot do anything else here than recommend Caesar's challenge to anyone who's willing to try it out, as it's easily one of the best board games on PC in the 90s. Astro Cantor of the Crescents is a side-view horizontally scrolling sci-fi anime-style action game, and another of those Korean hidden gems that saw a very limited release in the West, mainly through singular imports, as it is reported that only over 5,000 copies of the game were printed, and many of these were recalled later on because of the joke that one of the devs left in the game and forgot to remove before the release. The game is set in the 2095 during the War for Earth. Two factions fight for control of it and its orbit, Space World Community and Earth Liberation Front both sounding like opposing ends of the same extremist stick. Astro Counter is rather story-heavy, with plenty of dialogues between the characters, and as much as I'd like to give you a background of sorts in regard to what it's all about and what they're saying in all these cutscenes, I can't. But since you're a singular hero, going from left to right through most levels, defeating hundreds upon hundreds of enemies, mainly in melee combat, I think the story may go something like that. Once again, the conflict between two opposing forces brought Earth to the brink of destruction. You're working for one of the factions, against another. It doesn't take long, however, for you to realize that all is not what it seems, and that both of them are utterly evil. So you take it upon yourself to defeat them both and save the planet in the process. I may be wrong, but it's a generic action story mishmash, so it should fit nicely. Anyway, the levels are rather simple designed and for the most part require you to literally go from left to right and defeat anything that stands in your way. Your mech has few different attacks and they're not too difficult to pull off. That said, the game is extremely challenging, so I suppose that I could risk calling it a Souls-like of action titles of yesteryear. A mouthful perhaps, but the sentiment stands. Graphics and sounds are excellent and make the game really enjoyable to progress in, despite the difficulty even. So if you like either side view action games or souls like, Astro Counter is definitely something worth tracking down. Astrofire is a top-down fixed-screen arcade shooter and another take on a classic asteroids formula, with few small touches that make it different than the original is. But is it different enough to warrant a completely new game? I think you'll be able to answer it for yourself when we're done talking about it. It was released as shareware, split into three chapters of Into the Storm, Whirlpool of Death and Heart of Fire, all sounding like really cool titles for 1980s action movies and not chapters in a random game, preferably with a lone protagonist who against all odds defeats the overwhelming armies of evil, saving a girl and universe in the process, kinda like you tend to do in other games. Anyway, only the first of three chapters was available in the shareware version, the remaining two required a purchase. The main difference between Astrofire and Arcade Classic was that it offered power-ups in the form of two new and stronger weapons and a shield, which effectively negated the one-hit-kill mechanic of Asteroids, making Astrofire less demanding. Additionally, if you're someone who didn't like the momentum mechanics in the original or just wants a bit easier game, then it too can be toggled in the settings. The three episodes differ in the backgrounds and the enemy sprites, but other than that, they all play identical. Now, if you're an avid fan of Asteroids, I can pretty much guarantee that you'll love Astrofire. It's great looking, and while it sounds terrible, the playability of the original is definitely still intact, albeit a bit easier than you remember. But if you're not keen on the gameplay formula, then there's not enough new here to warrant tracking it down, as it's just the original in new tat flashier clothing. Avalon is an old-school style top-down view turn-based JRPG that funny enough did not come from Japan. The Earth is destroyed. Was it us or our mismanagement of climate and resources or some kind of a cataclysm? It's irrelevant. What is important is that some of us, a followers of so-called Avalon cult, managed to escape to a distant Earth-like planet of Avalon. When you start the game, some time has passed already and the colony is prosperous. Perhaps it's not the biggest or most advanced one, but it's safe and working. Colonists have grown accustomed to living on a new planet and the future of humanity seems to be secured. That is, until the day that one of the villages was attacked by the hundreds of strange-looking and unknown to us creatures. What's worse, the leader of the village, Lee, was captured by him as he was hoping to negotiate some kind of a peaceful solution to this rather aggressive situation. You play as Mace, yes, like the one in spray used against attackers. 
and you hope to help the inhabitants of your village and all colonists alike to continue thriving on the Avalon. The game is your typical single-player JRPG where you explore the map, visit towns, battle enemies random and otherwise gather information from and talk to NPCs, purchase and sell items, fulfill quests and solve occasional puzzles. Sadly, you don't get to have anyone join your party, but other than that it's a pretty standard fare. The battles are quite strategic and not built to be unforgivingly unfair, and overall, despite of its genre, simple presentation and being much less grindy than your typical JRPGs, Avalon feels very western. While it may not be the biggest or best RPG out there, and definitely not for the year it released in, it's a very competent and decently playing title with an unparalleled quality to price ratio, and all because it's a freeware. So even small nuisances like inability to pick up or interact with certain objects until you get the quest that they're a part of can be forgiven. As at the price of exactly zero dollars, they're easy to ignore. Central Intelligence is one of the most unique games I've covered in the series to date. It's a political espionage themed strategy with gameplay best described as a mixture of Shadow President and Midwinter. And it's still a bit different than what you think it is after hearing me mention the two. You play as a CIA chief sent to Chinese supported dictatorship island of Sao Madrigal, where your goal is to find a way to organize the recuperation of democracy. So, you will be closely working with the previous leader of the nation, trying to arrange a counter revolution to remove the current president from position of power. You have a wide range of various actions that you can take to make that happen, and they more or less fall into the two categories of propaganda and political orders. Decisions on your next steps and suitable approach should be based on the political climate, how the conditions in the country are developing at particular time and also on the support of democratic parties holding at the moment. As even if your actions are successful, keeping democratic leadership will be impossible without appropriate citizen support. The actions that you take are not direct, but rather you recruit spies and allocate them in various strategic locations across the island, issuing orders to them Emperor Palpatine style, so delegating most onto your network of subordinates. You know, let them take the hit if something goes wrong. I know, I said that there's two ways of working towards your goal, political or through propaganda, but in reality there's a third one too. And it's based in military actions. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why bother with diplomacy when we can just overwhelm the nation and install our own puppet in a sweep 1-2-3 move with a bit of planes, couple of bombs and a tank or two? Well, the government like that would never halt, and military actions should really only be used as a last resort. It's worth pointing out that while all I said may sound interesting and no doubt like something you'd like to try, but if you're looking for a game with action, this isn't it. Central intelligence for the most part is just a series of static screens on which you make small changes, issue orders and observe the results. And by observe, I actually mean read about them. But if you have a vivid imagination and don't mind a rather basic presentation and on top of that are interested in either politics or espionage, then there's quite a fun game here for you to tackle. Chewie Escape from F5 is a point-and-click adventure game. Chewie, a titular protagonist, is who you're in control of and he's out to achieve twofold when you start the game up. Rescue his friend from the evil Borgs who kidnapped him and steal a powerful so-called Red Glump from their high security zone called F5 so that they couldn't use it in their evil plans. And with a name like Borgs, which is neither Dorks nor Borgs, I have no doubt that the plans must be nefarious. In the process of doing so, Chewie's friend Clint manages to get his pose on the Red Glump and escapes with it using one of Borks' spaceships. On a side note, to me Red Glump sounds like a disease that would require a visit to a urologist and not a cornerstone of an evil scheme but whatever. The ship gets caught in a wormhole and moved thousands of light years away where it crash lands on an alien planet called Earth. And this is where you take control of Chewie and the game truly begins. On the first glance, both gameplay and presentation-wise, Chewie looks a lot like LucasArts's Day of the Tentacle. And truth be told, it's actually not that far off. Naturally, it never reaches the quality of the classic, but it's an excellent little-known German title nonetheless. Most puzzles are inventory-based and the humor and funny situations come most of the time from interactions of your inventory objects with the outside world and characters, kinda like in the aforementioned masterpiece. The story, while may not be as crazy and over the top, is also pretty fun and will no doubt keep you interested all the way to the end. Graphics and sounds are both excellent, maybe short of voiceovers, but you can't win them all, can you? And the music is well fitting and of high quality, so there's that. Truth be told, I've never completed Chewy and only maybe played it for an hour or so years ago, but it left a positive impression and what I found about it online seems to support the sentiment. So while I can't straight up recommend it given how little I really know about it, all I'll say is that it looks like it's worth tracking down and playing if you're into adventure games at all. 
Blackstar Agent of Justice is a shareware two-episode strong first-person perspective adventure game. You play as titular Blackstar, a private detective of Native American origin. The game starts quietly with a typical day in your life, but very soon jumps into a first case of a gruesome murder and intertwined with its sinister plot and also what's to come next after. And as adventure games go, this one's chock full of 20th century stereotypes and cheap nudity which seems to be forcefully added in anywhere it could theoretically be stuck in. Pun intended. It's not an issue, just an observation. All that provided you have a paid full version, as all the raunchy scenes are paywalled with a purchase. That said, they are entirely unnecessary and add nothing to the not so great story that the game follows. So, probably having a go at the shareware version will be enough for you to gauge if the game's worth your time, and come to the conclusion that it's probably not the case. Especially that it was basically written by a single person in his spare time. Thomas Vitako, I hope I haven't butchered his name, a heavy metal musician. So, not really an industry veteran by any definition of the word. And that's especially prominent when you're playing the game and try to do anything that's not the exact next step in the story that the creator planned for. You'll get a generic no reply of some sort stopping you in your tracks. So, Blackstar is linear to the extreme. If you don't play it in the exact way and order Thomas envisioned you would, you won't get far. And since the story is not really following a logic path, the game ends up being a click fest where you try everything everywhere until you find that one thing that gets you a step ahead in the plot. Fortunately, the graphics and puzzles are actually pretty decent, so they kinda save Blackstar from being a trash not worth playing. But it's still not far off. All that said, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone other than the most hardcore fans of adventure games, cause controls are as finicky as the game design is, and will take a while getting used to. Yes, Blackstar managed to mess them up too. Cliff Danger is an always scrolling 2D run and gun platformer, and if you want to better understand it, think just Jackrabbit but slower and with bigger sprites and more boobies, which obviously for the sake of this video and YouTube's algorithm will be limited. You're Cliff, the interstellar universal hero extraordinaire, so really the same person you are in real life. And one of those lazy space days when you're flying through the galaxy, as you do, you encounter an interstellar cry for help. Upon investigation, it seems that it's coming from the beautiful Amazon's Queen's ship. Her planet, Pleasure 6, awesome name I must add, has been invaded by the evil aliens known only as Glocks, and she pleads for help in saving her followers, so even more big chest as lonely and captured Amazons. How could you say no to that? I mean, you cannot leave a lady in distress, much less so numerous ladies. So, you set off to save them from a world composed out of 20 rather large levels, and that's precisely what you'll do. Kick butts of various different aliens come, and be the knight in a shiny armor saving the beautiful ladies from captivity. Short of the armor and the knight part. Other than that, Cliff Danger is your typical action platformer with a lot of both, action and platforming, and various kinds of weapon upgrades to boot. Graphics and sounds are really, really good. That said, the company that made the game and future Lula Sex Empire management titles, despite renaming itself with nearly every single game they released, was well known for high quality presentation, so it shouldn't be a surprise really. And here they definitely deliver. Question is, is there anything other than boobies that make Cliff Danger stand out from a crowd of dozens if not hundreds of other platformers? Not really, but booba or not, it's a very competent and actually fun to play title that all fans of the genre should definitely check out. Bricks is a top-down block-based puzzler, and the mechanics behind it are dead simple. There's a board and there are bricks on it. Each of the bricks has a shape drawn on top, and you must clear the board of all of them by sliding them so that the identical shaped bricks would touch, at least two of them, and when they do, they disappear. Now, you see where I'm going with this, right? You've seen it before. You may not be able to put the finger to where, but you've definitely seen it. And yes, you're right, you did. It's actually a carbon copy of a 1989's arcade classic, Paznik, that saw releases to most systems under the sun in a two-year window from its release in arcades. Anyway, some levels will feature three of each of the same marked blocks, and to remove them you have to make sure that they connect to each other at the same time, all within one move. Naturally, so that the game wouldn't be too easy, there are walls around the blocks preventing you from sliding them into each other willy-nilly, and there's an unforgiving timer that keeps ticking down no matter what. Even more so, most of the later levels only have a single correct solution, so you'll find yourself spending more time thinking and planning out moves rather than actually making them. If you're a fan of logic and puzzle games, Bricks is definitely something that you'll enjoy, despite its challenging nature. But if you're not, then it won't change your mind about them and may even annoy you with its complexity. 
Bug Bomber is a pretty fun and unique take on the tried and tested Bomberman or Dyna Blaster formula. So if you like the two, you'll love Bug Bomber as well. It can be played by 1 to 4 players simultaneously and features 50 action packed levels of exploding goodness. And believe it or not, it too, same as the originals, has a plot. You're assigned to squash the bugs plaguing the computer of some sort, so you jump in, like literally in, and that's what you'll attempt to do, navigating its maze-like circuitry. There are a few changes to the original though. First of all, your task is to change the color of special blocks scattered around the levels and destroy the enemies later. So rather than just killing, you also need to do something useful, I wanna say, but in reality it seems like a busy work if I'm to be honest. Anyway, same as in original, you have bombs to dispose of the enemies, but that's not all. And you also get access to proximity mines, blockades and so-called hatchlings that track the enemies on the board and attack them when within reach. Sounds cool, right? Good. There are also pickups in the form of either letters EN that restore your energy and IQ that instantly make you smarter and able to complete any game anytime from now until forever. Or I'm lying and they increase the tracking ability of the hatchlings. One of the two, I'm sure you can work it out. Same as in Bomberman, Bug Bomber is a lot more fun when played with others and not alone, both in co-op and competitive mode. It is virtually endlessly playable with friends. Alone, I'd give Bug Bomber 30-ish levels before the staleness of doing the same all the time starts to creep in and you begin looking for another title to play. Bunny Bricks is a new take on Arkanoid. It's more colorful, it has big sprites, it's overall more cartoony in its design, but in the same time, at least in my opinion, a bit confusing and less fun. I'll get to that in a bit though. Since it's chock full of color, it naturally also has to have a story. Your sweet sweet fairy girlfriend has been kidnapped by the evil giant ape and you, playing as Bunny, need to rescue her, getting through 30 rooms filled with bricks blocking the passage. Naturally, as in all Arkanoid-like games, you can't move to the next level before clearing the previous one first. So, since you've ventured onto the mission with your baseball bat, that's what you'll use to hit the ball against the bricks. And that's also what's most annoying about the game to me. I can never confidently say that I'm in full control of what I'm doing in Bunny Bricks. Every hit, every move looks and feels clunky to me. I'm not having fun whatsoever. And judging by the scores it received online, which were not terrible, mind you, but very aggressively average or just a smudge below average, Bunny Bricks, it seems, was no one's cup of tea. Or a baseball glove. Whatever. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato, french fries, chips. Oh, it seems that we accidentally started a game of name free things spot related. Anyway, there are obviously power ups in Bunny Bricks, they're your typical slower ball, super baseball bat, shot, etc. You know, standard fare for the genre, and they obviously drop from destroyed bricks every now and then and keep the gameplay afloat for a bit longer. Even with them though, Bunny Bricks is really not great, and having to actively press the button to hit the ball every single freaking time is beyond annoying. The only redeeming factor for the game since the sound are not fantastic either are the graphics, which are cartoony and rather nice even if nothing special for the year. All in all, Bunny Bricks proves that some games should remain simple to keep their playability, that sometimes more is less, but most of all that it's not worth to forcefully fix what's not broken. Iterate, sure, but do it smartly, choosing what to implement and what to ignore and not just go willy-nilly adding everything that comes to mind to your game at first thought. I'm sure that if Bunny Bricks was playtested by an external player as it was developed, we would have ended up with an entirely different product, possibly a decent one. Chomps is a Pac-Man clone made entirely in text mode ASCII graphics. Now that's something you don't see every day. The idea here is same as in original, you control a smiley face collecting dots and avoiding monsters patrolling the mazes. Cause you know, they couldn't be made to resemble ghosts in text mode, so they're monsters. Naturally, whenever one of them touches the smiley face, you lose a life. So let's try to make sure that that does not happen, okay? Same as in original too, each of the monsters have their own personality and behaves a bit different, chasing you in a unique way. Not necessarily identically as in the arcades, but they act noticeably different from one another. There are four mazes in the game and each of them has a different number of monsters roaming it. The only way of defeating them naturally comes in the form of the power pellets, after collecting which you're temporarily invulnerable and can chase and eat them for points. Every now and then the bonuses spawn in the maze and when collected they're worth extra points. Whenever a level is completed, the speed and difficulty of the next is increased a little. The presentation of chomps is obviously very basic, being made in ASCII characters and all, but for what it's worth, everything's easy to differentiate between and memorize. There are obviously much better Pac-Man clones out there, but for 1983 on those, chomps was actually a pretty decent effort and it's well worth a playthrough from time to time. 
Citizen's Backwater Affairs is so obscure that it never released. It was cancelled in the late alpha state before it could ever hope of reaching the market. That said, I'm not telling you about the game that does not exist. That would warrant a completely different video. Well, now that I think of it, I should make one about games that never were. But whatever, it's a subject for another time. While citizens were really cancelled, the unreleased early version and a demo can be found online and even played through DOSBox emulation. So, with that out of the way, what is citizens about at all? Well, it was inspired by the classic little computer people and you can think of it as a bit different Sims, before the Sims ever released and with a dark twist. At the start of the game you learn that you died in a road accident and that's the twist. After which you promptly taken into an afterlife where you're assigned the job of a caretaker of a small world under dawn known only as backwater. The town itself is an experiment created to figure out how much free will actually affects society. So, as you go about managing the closed of society, controlling all citizens individually, mischievous imps will take over some of them and force them to cause various kinds of trouble. The imps represent seven cardinal sins and when the person is actively corrupted and controlled by them, you cannot influence them whatsoever. So, instead, you must indirectly control others and have them try to fix whatever imps broke. The control you have over regular citizens is indirect and revolves around you messing with their emotions to have them respond to your prompts in a required manner. And obviously, the better you are to them, the more receptive they'll be to you. So using concepts like curiosity, greed and various needs is what you'll be feeding them to have them perform required tasks. Citizens' potential was huge, and it's clear even from those early alpha and demo versions that are both circling the internet. And yet, the game was cancelled anyway. What's worse, the original Sims released just a couple of years later and was a huge success. It was however a game where you had a direct control at all times if you only wanted to. So while there are certain similarities between them, the differences are rather prominent. All in all, even if never completed, it's definitely worth a look. For curiosity's sake, if nothing else. Some videos ago we've spoke about shareware puzzle platformer Clyde's Adventure. Wow, I've started using videos as a reference of time. So, several videos ago in a land far far away in the rich and prosperous kingdom of YouTube under a rule of Lord Google, I sat down and told you of a game that had no enemies to speak of. But instead, it was full of traps, switches and teleports. It also required you to collect a certain number of gems to be able to progress further. Clyde's Revenge is a sequel to that game. What or who is Clyde unleashing his revenge on is hard to tell. As same as in the original, there's no enemies or bosses in this one either. You still travel through numerous castles collecting what feels like thousands of gems and still involve yourself in some very simple but in the same time incredibly tedious environmental puzzling. Why? Because there seems to be levers everywhere. The farther you get in the game, the more you'll need to use these. And in no time, the game will turn into backtracking bonanza, seeing you visiting the same areas numerous times over, just passing through from switch to switch or to the next locked off area. I mean, I know that I praised the first game, but I feel that by 1995 the originality of the idea has long passed and milking the same cow with no novelty to the task was not as entertaining anymore. Sure, the no enemies idea is definitely still interesting, but complete lack of any noticeable changes to the gameplay formula of the game that came three years earlier is a bit disappointing. Especially that after a while rooms start to blend together and all begin to look the same. Don't get me wrong though, Clyde's Revenge is not a bad game. And if you never played the original, or if you did and loved it, then it may definitely be something you'd like. But if you played the first title and expected something new here, you will be unpleasantly surprised. To summarize, as a standalone title, for those who've not seen the original, it may be a cool different game to try out. For others, it all depends on how they feel about games by EA. Because while Clyde's Revenge may have nothing to do with them per se, their games are known for being released yearly and changing virtually nothing other than the number and the title screen. City Runner is a tiny, just a few kilobytes in size, 3D voxel based futuristic search and rescue game. You're behind the wheel of a police hovercraft and you travel around the city streets, finding and solving issues in troubled spots. They are indicated on the map with a flashing building, so direct yourself to these. When finally there, to resolve the issue, all you have to do is bounce your car into the flashing building. I know, silly, but if you keep in mind how small the game actually is and how advanced for the few kilobytes of size the game engine is, it's understandable that some concessions had to be made. And if you think about it, it's no different than playing an older classic 8-bit game, which often were incredibly simplistic in their design and hence allowed for a lot of freedom in interpretation of how things were done in them. So, imagine that you're playing an 8-bit game and all will be fine. Anyway, the point of it all is to obviously save as many targets as quickly as possible within given time limit, preferably unscathed. Because while you have to bump into troubled buildings, you shouldn't really into anything else. Each mission starts at the police station, where your shields are refilled and you're given a specific number of targets and time limit. 
From then onward, it's up to you to plan out your route to be the most efficient so that you could amass those bonus points for completing the missions in a timely manner. It's worth noting that you also have a speed boost at your disposal, which is really useful on those longer straight stretches to make good time. Graphics and sounds are both extremely basic in City Runner, but it's a tiny game, so most likely no real graphical elements are within its files and everything is generated on fly using its 3D engine, which is at least interesting if nothing else. To be clear, City Runner is not a great game, but I don't think that the developer, yeah, one person, ever hoped for it to be great, and it was probably just made as an idea concept. Naturally, I've no proof of that, but the simplicity and freeware distribution model kinda make it sound like it. Codename Iceman is Sierra's espionage-themed, slightly futuristic parser adventure game, but it's also much much more than that. It's also partly a submarine simulation, and when I say simulation, I don't mean submarine background in an adventure game, but a full-fledged simulation for whenever you're on the sub. Submarine sections of the game, however, are all scripted, so no random events there ever occur. That said, let's not get ahead of ourselves and start at the beginning. Sometime in the early 21st century, global oil shortage hit the earth. Most countries that were rich in the resource and its reserves are now on the brink of collapse, fighting non-violently so far for the remnants of it anywhere it can be obtained. USA and Soviets are on the forefront of the conflict, both using a lot of it and henceforth in the market of purchasing a lot too. Tunisia, out of all places, seems to have quite a lot left, so naturally both sides try to buy as much as they can from it to get a bigger foothold in and raise their influence on the Tunisia. Soviets arrange for the kidnapping of the US ambassador there, which effectively means that the most trade contracts with the US are cut instantly. You play as Johnny Quest. I mean, Johnny Westland, a naval officer sent in a super-secret submarine on an espionage mission of rescuing of the ambassador and preventing further escalation of the conflict. Sounds pretty cool, right? Well, if you don't mind the text parsers as much as I do, it actually can be, as it's very realistic in its inner workings and pretty fun adventure. Other than the submarine simulation sections where you have to tackle the enemy from time to time, the majority of the game is your typical Sierra adventure with everything that it entails. So great storytelling, a lot of puzzles and in the same time numerous points where you can get irreversibly stuck or even fail at the game if you don't follow correct military procedures. Yep, you heard that right. Anyway, presentation-wise, while Codename Iceman is not great, it's not below Sierra's average for the time. And if you enjoyed their other titles, especially Procedure Field Police Quest 1s, you'll like Codename Iceman too. Cold Dreams is a shareware sci-fi themed side view flip screen action platformer, and a mouthful it seems as well. You travel to a mysterious legendary red planet of Swanda that is said to conceal great mysteries defended by the ancient monstrosities. To prove your worth, you take it upon yourself to explore the underground maze beneath the planet's surface and uncover its secrets. The game is composed out of three large worlds divided into smaller stages. The shareware version only contains the first world, not a lot, but definitely enough to sample the gameplay and decide on the purchase. So, what you'll mainly be doing in Cold Dreams is running around flip screen mazes of underground crypts, collecting weapons, keys and solving puzzles. Keys are naturally used to unlock previously unreachable locations, and you'll often have to do a lot of backtracking as they're hardly ever nearby to locations that require opening. Some of the puzzles might demand the use of free-floating robot companion that you'll obtain, and he can be used as an independent support in combat or controlled directly for use in set puzzles. While his presence in the game is nothing that hasn't been done before, the mechanic is still rarely used, so it's a nice change of pace to many other platformers, having him there offer a bit different gameplay formula to your typical running, jumping and shooting found in most similar games. Five available weapons work differently against different enemies and obstacles, so learning their best case usage scenarios is a must especially given that the ammo is not unlimited. Other than that, there are also power-ups in the form of life boosters, bombs suitable for clearing large caches of enemies among others, and shields. All these are used at will, so if you see them, grab them, they don't have to be used then and there and can be held for when needed. Cold Dreams is a fun unique platformer and a very decently looking game for a shareware title. It may not be the best the genre has to offer, but it's definitely a very solid and entertaining addition to anyone's library of games. Command Adventure Starship is a sci-fi space-based action shooter with some very superficial strategy elements. You could say that it's similar to Star Control 2, but with much simpler, less epic plot. The year is 2127 and the Great Interstellar War just ended. And while the peace between 12 nations may be shared, it doesn't mean that it's safe in the universe and that there's nothing there to do or discover. Since the galaxy is still full of unclaimed planets to explore, you jump in your ship to embark on a quest of finding and securing suitable planets for your race to claim. 
and it's gonna be a challenge as the space is full of pirates, aggressive aliens just waiting to attack and plunder wandering ships, and if that wasn't enough, even some of your past enemies are out there to get you. You start the game by choosing one of 12 races that you'll be a part of, then you purchase your first ship, hire crew, and buy the necessary equipment. From then onward, Command Adventure Starship focuses on space exploration and combat, both in space and on the ground. The game is mainly played from the top-down perspective and you can combat other ships that you'll meet or are attacked by. You can land on planets and dock on abandoned and disabled ships and even send away teams to secure the areas or planets. To claim the planet, the away team needs to include an engineer securing the location. Money is earned by claiming planets and capturing alien equipment and you'll need a lot of it. Why? Because your ship is a constant work in progress and you can reconfigure and upgrade it all throughout the game. Heck, with over 50 ships to choose from, you can change to a different one too, more than once. On top of that, there's over 80 different pieces of equipment for them, ranging from weapons through shields to the engines. There's a lot of content here is what I'm saying. Command Adventure Starship may lack the charm of Star Control 2, but with entirely randomized universe on each start of the game, it stays fresh for all playthroughs. Cosmic Sheriff is a first-person flip-screen shooter. In the future of 2023, yep, you heard that right, future, Cobalt has become the element of great strategic importance. It is however very rare and basically depleted everywhere it could be mined for other than Io, one of Jupiter's moons. So we came together, pulled all our remaining resources and managed to install an extraction plant on its surface. It seemed that all was going the right way for us. Until the plant was taken over by the rebels, that is. Because of course it was, otherwise we'd had no game to play. They planted booby trap pumps that are rigged to explode if their requests are not met. Scary stuff, right? Dying in space with no help and chances of survival whatsoever? Terrible. Anyway, you play as Peter Jones, the single best sniper in the galaxy and also the titular Cosmic Sheriff. And your task is to do both, deactivate the pumps and kill the saboteurs. The game is composed out of three thematically unique zones of warehouses, computer and control systems and finally the surface. And they consist of three, five and nine different levels respectively. The pumps are always hidden behind the door, so you need to shoot the doors first to check if the rigged pumps are behind them. Keep in mind however that they may as well unveil one of the numerous dangerous alien enemies working for the rebels. And they are deadly, so be fast and even deadlier than they are. Cosmic Sheriff's presentation is rather weak, the sounds are terrible and CGA graphics are dreadful, I mean just look at them. Any of the 8-bit ports of the game looked way better. Even poor Specky which usually color clashes like crazy looks better. But whatever, 1989 was a transitional time for PC and some games still stuck to the old and slowly phasing out CGA. Gameplay wise, Cosmic Sheriff is… okay, even if rather simplistic. So if you like those basic shooters, you may enjoy it. If you look for more meat on the bone so to speak, better look somewhere else. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to disappoint you. Cougar Force is totally not what you hoped that it would be. There are no cougars in it. Actually, there's hardly any women in the game. Not to mention cougars. I know, a terribly wasted opportunity. I mean, we could have Charlie's Angels or even A-Team, but with girls situation here. And yet, it seems the devs did not knew what they were doing. Oh well, whatever. It is what it is. This, Cougar Force, is an action-adventure title in vain of your generic super spy game. So, you play as Cougar, a special agent of some kind. I like to imagine him being called something totally unfitting to the surname, something like Bartholomew or Jebediah Cougar. Strong names for the field, not great for explosive action. On the other hand, I'm Blaze, the name of an action hero and the most action I've seen in years was when I tripped over my own leg rush into the toilet after eating something that did not take well with me. So perhaps I shouldn't judge the hero by his name. Anyway, you're Jebediah Cougar, a special agent, and you have to penetrate the criminal's fortress to retrieve important information on a new drug of some sort. The game is divided into three sections, each offering entirely different gameplay experience. So, the first is side view shooter action, where you fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat with criminals, search for the keys to open doors, eventually get a gun even, and finally escape jumping into a plane. In second, you're flying that plane in first-person perspective simulation style over the enemy territory, shooting down attacking airplanes with guns and missiles. In third, you escape on the motorbike, running away in time before the bomb explodes. Despite there being three of these unique parts to the game, only ever the first one is available recorded on YouTube, so that's what you'll watch it. Sorry, it seems it isn't very popular among the retro gamers. And I kinda get why, because while it's doing nothing wrong really, and it's rather unique, it also doesn't do anything well, and the animations in particular could use few extra frames to feel smooth. In the end, it's a decent, yet not great generic James Bond type of a game, that's okay for one playthrough and then you'll never want to come back to it again, simply because there'll be no reason to. 
Crackdown originated in the arcades and it's a top-down 2D action shooter. Its story goes more or less like this. The Atlantis exists. I know, shocking. But that's not all. The evil scientist slash billionaire took residence there and created a secret army of artificial soldiers. Another mind blow. Can there be more than that? Well, I don't think so, cause after hearing the first two I suppose you can figure out the rest. Yep, he obviously wants to take over the world. Fortunately, while his plans are no doubt ambitious, they're not very secret. So United Nations gather to find a solution. It is decided that sending the two covered special forces officers only known as Ben and Jerry is the best course of action. Ben and Jerry's? I'm so sorry guys, it seems Batman mixed in his shopping list with my script here again. Naturally, I meant Ben and Andy. Anyway, they all two infiltrate the Atlantis and destroy the enemy base using a super secret new bomb, codenamed Sigma. Definitely named after Sigma males that both of our heroes are. Crackdown is one of those games that's easy to understand and difficult to master. Cause all you really have to do in each level is place bombs on all marked by X spots, naturally with an allotted time limit. When you do that, head for the exit. Simple as that. If that was all, however, not only the game would be easy, but also boring, and the whole intro about an army of evil villains lackeys would be entirely pointless too. So, there's enemies, enemies everywhere, and they're all out to get you. And I gotta say that they're the weirdest army that I've seen to date. Some only use melee attacks, others shoot, and there are even those that use Dragon Ball-like fireball kamehamehames against you. It's wild. It's not a surprise then that you have to get rid of all the enemies you come across by shooting them or by running away. Since the ammo is limited, it's best to keep it for those more life-threatening situations rather than waste it on singular bodies. Having to avoid the enemies and not kill a lot is a refreshing mechanic for a shooter, if nothing else. To summarize, Crackdown is super fun, even if a bit repeatable arcade shooter that's just much much better when played with a friend. So, if you like this, don't skip it. Red Ghost sounds like the name of a super spicy pepper. That should burn through your guts like a lava through a piece of plastic and leave you with a red hot flaming memory of them on the next few toilet visits. But it's also a tactical strategy and real time first person perspective combat mixture. And that's what we'll focus on today. I know, sounds like a concussion that not only should not work but also even exist. And yet it does. But let's start at the very beginning. The titular Red Ghost is not a pepper but a secret Russia based criminal organization that strives for world domination. And trust me, I'm not playing the familiarity card here, it's part of the background story. So, Red Ghost seems to have secret bases scattered around the world and all of them filled with high-tech weaponry and latest military inventions. Since they don't lack in manpower either and they're everywhere, no country alone can stand against them. No country can, that's for sure, but you can. You are, after all, a multiverse hero, a veteran of numerous conflicts and the smartest person I've never had a chance to meet, yet. So, you will command 18 of the world's most elite group of fighting men, soldiers, badasses or however you want to call them, against the overwhelming enemy forces, all to stop the seemingly unstoppable threat. As I said initially, the game is a mixture. In strategy view, you plan out your attacks and then when the combat starts, you get to take active part in it in first person view, controlling any of the 18 elite soldiers and dozens of various combat vehicles, like jeeps, helicopters, tanks and artillery too. It sounds cool, doesn't it? Tactically planning out offensives and traps for the enemy forces and then leading them by yourself, switching between different units. It sounds like a dream come true. And it is. A dream only, that is. As neither the strategic layer nor the first person action are fully fleshed out, everything feels as if it was tied with a hair thin strings of promises ready to be broken. And worst of all, for the life of me I can't tell you why, but it's just not fun. It's nowhere near the worst game I've seen, it's not even in the same league as they are, but somehow I could never enjoy it. Perhaps it's just me being old picky grump and not the game. Perhaps. Anyway, the scarcity of the footage available for it online should be the best proof of its obscurity. And in this particular case, it's for the best maybe. As like I said, it's not great. The only thing worth noting about Red Ghost would be the presentation in the cutscenes, which seem to use the brand spanking new medium for the time, in the form of CDs, to the fullest. I think it would be best if you give it a go yourself and made your own mind about it, cause clearly it's not my cup of tea. Excelsior Phase 1 Lysandia is a top-down traditional tie-based role-playing in the vein of the first few Ultima games, and the first part in Duology of Games, second releasing seven years later in 2000. Story-wise, Lysandia is under a threat of destruction, terrible monsters emerge from everywhere, and the king seems to have lost his mind or be fallen to a dark control of some evil unknown force acting erratically and forfeiting all reason. Your task is to find the source of the chaotic presence, eliminate it and save the planet in the process. 
You play as a so-called fixer, a demi deity under employee of the Grand Council of the Watchers. Full-fledged, if I can even call them that, deities, gods, if you will, that created the universe, multiverse, cupcakes, ice cream and everything else too, and now they oversee it. It is your job to fix what's broken whenever something is broken. Because usually, when the Grand Council plans something for a particular world, it happens without fail and fixer services are only employed whenever something goes awry and history jumps off of its pre-planned path. Same as in aforementioned Ultima games, the focus is not on presentation, graphics, sounds and all the flashy bits that many games seem to parade like their only selling point. Lysandia is instead placing all its bets on the storytelling, which is exceptional, I must add. Clearly written with a lot of care to details, minute and all, full of twists and turns that will keep you on the edge of your seat if you decide to give it a chance and follow through. The quests, main and side, are numerous too and all worth completing to get better and that small step closer to your ultimate goal. Lysandia features over 140 unique items to find, use and equip, more than 100 types of monsters and townspeople, over 100 individuals to converse with, a 35 spell strong magic system, 30 plus cities, villages, dungeons and keeps to find and explore, and all that guarantees easily dozens of hours of role-playing fun. So, if you enjoyed early Ultimas, you'll have a hell of a time playing Lysandia. Oh, and the presentation is crap, obviously, but that was implied when I compared it to the classic, so no one should be surprised here, really. Following the theme of mixing strategy and action that the Red Ghost started in this video, I give you Muzzle Velocity, also a strategy and also a game in which during battles you get to control vehicles in first-person perspective and take an active part in combat. And while the choice of units composition, placement in strategy mode and real-time combat from the cockpit of the vehicle seems similar to the earlier mentioned game, the setting and theme is nothing alike. Muzzle Velocity takes place during World War II on the European front and is composed out of 150 single-player missions that can be played either as separate encounters or a whole campaign. And if you pick the latter, definitely more interesting game mode, you'll not only get to complete all of them in chronological order, but also your successes and losses in the earlier will influence the latter. So, the better you do during encounters, the bigger the range of orders that you can issue in the strategic layer will be too, and vice versa. There's around 100 different units to control collectively and they represent US, British and German vehicles from Allied and Axis sites respectively. While the strategic layers may not be comparable to the giants of the genre like Panzer General for instance, the action part of muzzle velocity is pretty fun. Sure, the controls are not very straightforward and will no doubt take time to get used to, but when you do eventually, the game really gains in the fun department. In fact, it's heaps better than the Red Ghost, so if you're gonna pick one of the two to play, definitely pick this one. Especially that you can switch control between different troops all the time and change vehicles too, be it tanks, jeeps or planes, all are at your disposal. Muzzle Velocity may not be the best strategy or even shooter, despite it being its biggest selling point, but it's definitely fun and that's the most important thing about it. It also sports a cool name that doesn't sound like something that can cause spontaneous and painful gastric events, which is always a good thing. When I look at Cosmic Spacehead, two things come to my mind. First, that it looks like those old classic Hanna-Barbera cartoons, you know, Flintstones, Jetsons, Yogi Bear the likes. And second is the time when I first saw it in a gaming Mac. I still had an Amiga then and it looked like something straight from a cartoon, so I needed to get it. I craved it, I wanted it and I was sure it'd be great. And believe it or not, as many games as I managed to get my paws on, I never secured Cosmic Spacehead on the Amiga, which is odd given how easily accessible pirated copies of the games were back then. You could basically get one within a week or so from its official release. It was a real wild west of gaming back then. Despite that, I never saw it until I got a PC. And even then, it was not straight away but years later when it meant nothing to me anymore and I didn't even recall the title. That's how obscure it was. At least where I live, that is. Anyway, Cosmic Spacehead is a side view action arcade adventure, and it's an unusual one, as while technically being more of an adventure than anything else, it mixes both genres quite well. You spend most of your time in the adventuring part of the game, where same as in most other point and clickers you explore the available locations, find and use various objects, and talk to characters that you'll meet. So do the typical point and clicking and point and clicking till you exhaust all the available options and have to progress further. So, when you have to go to a new location, one you've not been to before, you are actually required to traverse there in an arcade minigame, which is perhaps not the strongest enough quality while addition to be a separate game, but as a in-between adventure sections palette cleaner, it works perfectly. When a particular arcade section has been completed between the two locations, it won't require redoing on future traversals through it. 
but worry not, if you like this, they're quite varied, ranging from astro car racing through robot attacks to asteroid fields and anything in between, and there's 32 of them, so should last you a while. Story-wise, you're Linus, an alien boy who crash landed on an unknown to in planet Earth and after coming back home is greeted with disbelief, doubts and ridicule when it comes to his extraterrestrial discovery. So, he aims to get back to Earth to take pictures that would prove that it actually exists. Simple story perhaps, but I feel the game was always targeted towards a bit younger audience, so it fits rather well. If you get a chance, definitely check it out, but I wouldn't go out of my way to seek it out if I didn't have it already. Do you remember a point-and-click adventure conquest of the longbow by Sierra? Well, unbelievably long-titled Crazy Nick's Software Picks, Robin Hood's Games of Skill and Chance, is a sorta sidekick title to that main game. It introduces us to the protagonist of the conquest and allows us to partake in three thematically fitting minigames. First is an archery, in which you obviously shoot at the targets with your bow in the first-person perspective, taking wind into account. Each series consists of three shots, after which the points are tallied. You cannot win or lose in this one within the rule sets of the game at least, so it would have to be played against a friend to offer any kind of competition really. But it's not bad overall, gameplay-wise that is. The second, called Nine Man's Morris, is a puzzle board game where you have to defeat the opponent at it. It's a two-player game where each of you has nine pieces and you are placed on the board that consists of 24 spots where these pieces could be placed, so on corners and line crossings. The objective here is to create the so-called meals, so three pieces of the same color in a line, without any empty spaces or opponent's pieces between them. Oh, and diagonals do not count towards it. And every time you create a meal, you can remove one of opponent's pieces from the board. To win, you have to either get to the point where your opponent cannot make any more moves, or when he has only two pieces left. Third and final game is Sticks, and it's basically a recreation of a battle against Saracen at the end of Conquest. You have four attacks and four defensive slash evasive moves available, and an opponent to beat. Simple as that. While being entirely different from one another, all three minigames are pretty fun, though I question their staying power over the initial 20-30 minutes each. They're a fun, small collection of gaming distractions to fire up once every few years for a game or two, but other than that, I feel that they're nothing more than the advertisement for the full game. Which is way better, obviously, than these three alone could ever be. Creature Shock is what I go through every time my boss's monster of a wife comes to work. Now, I swear on my Batman's life that every time she comes over, the temperature in the office drops like 10 degrees and everyone's mood even more so. She's like one of those witches that seem to be suspended an inch over the ground, hovering silently, never moving her legs and spitting venom with every word that comes out of her mouth. The legend says that once, years ago, she died and went to hell, but the devil couldn't stand there and sent her back, cause hell wasn't big enough for both of them. He also feared that she may be more evil than he could ever be. Fact. Creature Shock is also a first and third person sci-fi on-rail shooter. In the far off future, Earth reached such a level of overpopulation that it could no longer comfortably sustain all of us. So, it was decided that it was the high time that we looked for a new planet to call home, an Earth 2.0, so to speak. So state-of-the-art spaceship, the Amazon, was sent to investigate Saturn and Jupiter to figure out if they were suitable for terraforming and potential future colonization. A little before the ship was supposed to come back home, all contact is lost, and all we've left with is a distress beacon signal, beeping and booping with no additional message. As our species future is on the line, a task force of the best of the best is quickly assembled and you play as that crew that was sent out to figure out what happened with the Amazon. And since we've already established that Creature Shock is an on-rail shooter, you can pretty much guess what was the Amazon's fate. Most of your time in-game you'll spend in the first-person mode shooting various sized alien monstrosities on FMV backgrounds. And there's a bucket full of them, from small to gigantic, all different, all unique and all having a very specific weak point that shooting at is required to defeat them. These are usually either red or white and most of the time easily distinguishable from everything else on the ginormous beast. Other than that, there are also two 3D third-person perspective ship flying sections, which see you going forwards and shooting at oncoming enemy forces. These are far less impressive technically and gameplay-wise, but a nice change of pace anyway. Creature Shock's presentation is really good for 1994, but given that in most cases it's pure FMV, with only some spots rendered in real time to aim for, those weak points I mentioned before, it's not a great game for multiple playthroughs. Two or three times over the span of few years should last you a lifetime, and if you add to it, that, at least to me, some of the targets you're supposed to go for do not offer visible feedback when you hit them, I tend to get annoyed easily, cause I'm not sure if the shots I take even count. Creature Shock is not a bad game, 
and definitely one that surprised with its graphics in 1994. But today, when I look at all on their own rail shooters that released over the years, there's literally a dozen or so of better ones out there. So, unless you're really into these, there's no point in tracking it down other than the graphics perhaps. Creep Clash is not your yearly emo slash macabre lovers convention, no, that could actually be fun, and it's better known as Creep Bash. Don't fact check it, trust me. I'm your friendly everyday YouTuber after all. Creep Clash is a single worst versus fighting game that I've ever seen. But before I get into details, let me tell you about its bad, albeit fortunately short background story. Every year in the land of Eternal Night, Creeps, so Pumpkin Pyre, Ludwig van Vampire Bat, Frankenclot and Demon Spawn fight on the Halloween night at midnight on the so-called ancient battleground of the Mists of Cimetoria to figure out who will become the champion and thus open an ancient great door to the living. Did you get all that? Good, because I'm not repeating this rubbish again. Though it's worth pointing out that the character names are pretty cool. The rest of the game isn't though, so don't get your hopes up. Crypt Clash is a 2.5D versus fighter. The characters are all built out of 7 or 8 polygons each, and the gameplay is taking place on a two-dimensional plane. There are four of these forementioned undead to choose from, and they all suck. No, really, they make Shaqfu and Brutal Pulse of Fury feel like works of art. Like amazing games, nay, the best fighters out there. By sheer contrast, that is. And I didn't think that I would ever be forced to say it, but Creep Clash may actually be even worse than Dangerous Streets. And whomever played it knows what kind of a long and expensive therapy is required after doing so. Creep Clash, it seems, is a creation that the devs put together over a pizza one evening while heavily intoxicated on a nondescript mixture of off-brand alcoholic beverages and barely aware of what was happening around them. It's a magic mushroom induced nightmare of a game that should never exist. Everything that could go wrong with Creep Clash did. The backgrounds are mostly dark and static, featuring close to no details at all. The characters look as if the 3D engine only accepted base geometrical shapes to be used and only few at the time so that the polygon count would never cross 10. The sounds are rather bad, even for a fighter, which are not known for best sound design and gameplay. Well, it's at F minus level. Better yet, F double minus. So, technically speaking, the game has some kind of a gameplay there and it's working, but it's definitely not fun whatsoever. I mean, perhaps each of the four has their own specific attack and a few moves even, but trust me when I say this, you won't play it long enough to learn them. It's awful, it's terrible, it's a trash. Avoid Creep Clash at all costs. Cross Country USA Home Edition is a, well, um, home edition of an educational US geography software slash game. Also a simplified business management driving simulator mixture. So as you can see, a mishmash of genres and themes, unlike anything else out there. It has 19 different scenarios built in and you can choose and complete them in any order. Each sees you driving around USA in an 18-wheeler, picking up and delivering variety of cargo. All of these scenarios are self-contained challenges that when completed do not influence the conditions or progress of others. Cross Country USA is built in a way that will try to teach you a little about areas that you visit and more importantly some useful life skills, like time management, decision making, problem solving and map reading often in combination of more than one at once. So, as you go about completing your chosen scenario, you will have to choose how you want to get to your destination, when to eat, rest and sleep, carefully watch weather conditions taking season and climate into consideration, you'll need to decide when to refuel, if your truck requires repairs, and if it does then when and where to get them, because a minor thing may not be a huge issue for quite a while, but having truck repaired then and there on the spot may slow you down considerably, and commodities need to be delivered in a timely manner. Also, there are some minor but appearing from time to time semi-regularly little events that require solving, usually by going your time to target conditions and then making a decision about them. Stuff like whether you should pick up a hitchhiker or not, or even answering a simple quiz about state or a city that you're in. Originating from much older educational software, Cross Country USA Home Edition may not be the best game in any genre it even partly belongs to, but it's a pretty fun title to fire up once in a while, just to relax and play something that's different to majority of other games. The graphics, even in SVGA, are rather simple and the animations are dog shit. No, really, they're terrible and running at what feels like 10 FPS at most. But fortunately, the game is a management slash simulation, so it's not really a deterrent from playing. <laughs> 
Crown is an action arcade game in which you play a role of a king wannabe noble. And to become one, the king, that is, you need to overcome series of challenges all around the world. And all I just said are really big words that in reality mean that it's a collection of six minigames. You can approach the country's, excuse me, challenges in any order you'd like, and they are all different from one another. In England, you're controlling a night dog riding on a horse, jumping over hurdles and collecting shields. If you manage to grab a specific number, the challenge is considered beaten. In Scandinavia, which is not a country but a region consisting of few countries, you play as a viking duck on a boat. And the aim is to collect treasure chests while avoiding whales crossing your way. In Russia, you're a bear, because of course that you are, and you try to imitate a dance that the lady next to you is performing. In Japan, you're a beaver, I think, because he kinda looks like one, and he rides a dragon, jumping from moat to moat over obstacles and munching on something that resembles pumpkins or oranges along the way. You need to collect most of these there to succeed. In India, you're an elephant boy crossing a bridge that looks like a conveyor belt, avoiding bananas and their peels and trying to catch eight mice. And as much as I can understand all the stereotypes so far, the one with mice just goes over my head. So if you know the origins of it, please let me know. Unless it's something about an elephant and a mouse, because that's also feasible. Never mind. Finally, in Arabia, you're monkey flying a, well, flying carpet and need to collect flying magic lamps and avoid the clouds. While Crown is an interesting set of minigames, they're not very fun on their own, and even as a pack of six provide just a little staying power. I can easily see you playing it once or twice every decade or so and then letting it gather dust on a shelf for another 10 years. Crown's graphics are pretty decent, though nothing to write home about, and the sounds and music are a bit disappointing, generic and not of high quality. If you like minigames games, Wow, that sounds pretty stupid even if it's technically correct. But if you do and have someone to play them with, I can imagine Crown being something to fire up once in a while. Alone, once or twice a decade at most makes sense to me too. Cyberlaw aka Cyberpolice is a final fight, Mortal Kombat and Rise of the Robots all rolled into one, for better or worse. And to simplify, it's a futuristic, extremely brutal, side-scrolling beat-em-up. The evil and nefarious Scorpion Gang has taken over the city and they run rampant causing chaos and terrorizing the citizens. It is up to you, playing one of the cyber police agents, to put a stop to the rain. To do so, you will traverse six stages, defeating hundreds of Scorpion Gang's goons and finally their evil leader, Jemaya himself. Yes, Jemaya and not Jeremiah. Whatever. Each of the characters that you can pick for the mission has different stats and they represent the typical trio for the genre. So one's fast but weak, the other's slow but strong and the last sits somewhere in between. Cyberlaw can be played in single player, cooperatively and in the survival mode. And while the first two are your typical begging into an end gameplay for one or two players respectively, the third puts you in the test trial to see how many of the enemy attacks you can survive before failing. It's a breath of fresh air for the genre, although arguably it would work better in a more polished game. Other than having to play as robots, the most obvious selling point of Cyberlaw is that it features a lot of blood. And by a lot, I really mean a lot. Every punch, kick or a weapon used against the bodies has them spill it by the bucket. And it's not unusual to complete the stage or a part of it with a floor completely covered with bodies and red. But don't let the goriness fool you, while undoubtedly oddly feeling when played, Cyberlow is actually pretty fun. Perhaps not as good as giants of the genre are, but definitely worth a playthrough every now and then, even if the enemies repeat more than I'd like them to. The sounds are what you'd expect them to be in a fighter, so all the punches and kicks are appropriately meaty, but nothing above the genre average, and the graphics are high res. And while because of it they feature considerably more detail than the older games did, I kinda prefer the classic arcade pixel perfect ones more, games like Alien vs Predator or Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, they just look better to me. Cyclemania is a rather fun but also clunky and oddly playing motorcycle racing game. Kinda like me, I'm also rather fun but clumsy and oddly acting person. And it's one of those games that wanted to do something new, something else than the others did with the FMV sequences. So, rather than having real-time rendered or even typical for FMV games pre-rendered backgrounds, it uses pre-recorded video footage of tracks that you'll race on. Which, on the first glance, look quite nice on all five included courses, but the more you play the game, the more the shortcomings of this solution will become painfully obvious. As much as the video background is an interesting choice, looking arguably better than low-poly pre-rendered solution of yesteryear would be, in reality, the speed at which the footage is running makes it look choppy and the video compression adds blockiness to it too. Playing the game on CRT may actually negate the issue, but I don't know anyone who still has a CRT screen and on modern displays the artifacts are more than prominent. 
That said, if you overlook this little graphical annoyance, the gameplay itself is quite enjoyable. Both your biker, opponents and oncoming traffic are digitized sprites with various levels of scaling to them, and completing each of the five tracks once or twice can actually be fun. Other than that, there are six differently feeling bikes to choose from and they can even be upgraded between the races. But sadly, all the upgrades other than the engine are cosmetic only and have no real impact on the bike's behavior. At least I never noticed any myself. And the aforementioned engine upgrade only influences the top speed, so it's hardly something that would change the way you experience the game. Last but not least, one thing that I could never get used to is how your drivers represented in the game. You have this first-person perspective view, so naturally you'd assume that it's a first-person game, where you race from a biker's point of view, speeding along those digitized tracks like a true racer that you are. Well, not the case here whatsoever, and the yellow dude flowing all over the screen is who you really control. It's an odd choice and one that I find really immersion-breaking. Because even if I dodge the oncoming traffic with the yellow biker, it feels really weird to have it pass through the bike's dashboard. In other words, it's as if you drove straight into it. Not my type of experience when racing constantly questioning my reality. Though, truth be told, I do it in real life too. Question, the reality that is. And every six months to a year, just in case, I casually check if the telekinesis doesn't really exist. Cause you never know. Dark Century is a futuristic deathmatch shooter with a twist, but we'll get back to it in a minute. In the 23rd century, prison overcrowding becomes a very serious issue. Well, if you keep in mind how big of an issue it is today, you can only imagine what it is 200 years from now. Anyway, in the game's present, so our future, it is sorta of solved by creation of so-called spatial detention centers where the prisoners are kept off-planet in a relative, at least by the prisons as we know today's standards, comfort, but also have to work in the factories there, manufacturing goods for the free folk back on Earth. And while these factories produce variety of things, some, like the one that's the subject of today's video, makes tanks. Yes, tanks, those heavily armored cannon-wielding vehicles of destruction. I'm Batman! Bruce said that if I carry on eating the way I do this Christmas break, I will become a vehicle of destruction myself. Apparently I'm so heavy that I'm on the verge of becoming a celestial object. So yeah, thanks for those, well, not so kind words, Bruce. So the prisoners decided to escape, as they do, because otherwise we'd had no game to play. And they reprogrammed some of these tanks to explode as they are leaving the factory, providing means of escape for them. You play as a warden who has to do twofold destroy the tanks that are about to escape and program these that are still under your control to do the same to the others. And that programming is the aforementioned twist, and something that makes Dark Century stand out from the crowd of other shooters. Cause graphics, sounds and gameplay definitely don't. So if you're at least a little into programming and slash or prefer your games to require a bit more from you than quick reflexes and a trigger finger, then it may be a game for you. Cause even if simplified, the programming itself may be more interesting than the regular tank driving and shooting is. Because, in essence, and on the surface, Dark Century is just glorified deathmatch, with pretty bad graphics and awful sound at that. Sadly, there's only one type of tanks that you can pilot a program, and one that the enemies have. So even with this little twist of the typical shooter formula, Dark Century's replayability is rather questionable. But if you want to try something really novel, it's worth checking out. Cyberwar is based on the movie The Lone Mower Man and serves as the follow-up to its story. It's also a sequel to your priors The Lone Mower Man and a collection of cyberpunk slash futuristic themed minigames based on the movie's virtual reality segments too. So, it's milking the same cow for the second time, so to speak. And even a year earlier, it was not a cow but a bull, so not much there to squeeze out really. Once again, the minigames are not great, and their only redeeming factor are FMV sequences and pre-rendered graphics. By 1994, however, most gamers could easily tell which FMV games were genuine gems among numerous piles of video sequence field poops, and which were only using the gimmick to squeeze money out of misled players' pockets. And I'm sure you can guess which one the cyber war is. You play as Dr. Angel once more and he's sent into virtual reality to defeat Job. Again. Now, if you remember correctly, Job was disabled in real world, but also had his brain processing capacity over 400% larger than that of a regular person. Inaccessible in real world, perhaps, but after entering the virtual reality, it was increased even more so. So, naturally, he abandoned his physical body and became a virtual only being. You know, one of these that could be defeated by pulling the plug out of socket. Anyway, most of the mini-games that you partake in will be of arcade kind and will see you avoiding obstacles or dodging things, usually by hitting appropriate arrow keys at the right time. But some are more logic-based and will see you solving a puzzle to enter a code. All of them, however, share one thing. They're all boring. Yeah, I said it. Boring. 
as in devoid of fun. The dev seat seems never realized that at a certain point the graphics cannot make up for gameplay, or lack thereof really, like in the case of this piece of shovelware. And we ended up with a beautiful, but ultimately disappointing 3 CD strong monster of a game that is not worth the time it takes to run it. Compared to its predecessor, Cyber War looks stunning with its pre-rendered graphics and FMV sequences running in 256 colors and not 16, but other than that it's the same convoluted mess with even less comprehensive and entirely non-linear hard-to-follow story. All that said, it's definitely worth checking out once, just to see what was the absolute top-of-the-line graphics back then, and how they could be spoiled by a broken, nay, non-existent gameplay mechanics. Darkspire is a top-down fantasy action RPG with some very intricate puzzling mechanics. The world is on the brink of a fertile destruction, not ours, though ours is probably close to, but we're tackling the one of the games first. And as grim as the future looks, there's still a chance to save it. To do so, the Darkspire must be conquered, all of the monsters within it defeated and puzzles solved. Also, five powerful runes should be gathered too, they are however scattered around the depths, or heights I should say really, of the Maze Lake Tower, created 300 years prior by the gods of war, intelligence and magic. Darkspire is composed of 50 levels full of death around each and every corner, sometimes in the form of deadly creatures and sometimes as puzzles of devilish design. So being the hero that you've always been and seeing that as per usual no one else is willing, you decide to enter the Darkspire and face the challenges, both physical and those of the mind, to find the runes and save the world. Darkspire is a full-fledged dungeon crawling RPG only viewed from above and not the first-person perspective. So you have a lot of weapons and armor pieces to choose from, complex magic and potion creation system, and skills, both magical and combat, that raise upon use, which is something that I always liked in my RPGs. Additionally, all items you find in the game can have more than one use case scenario. For instance, a piece of armor may be worn, but can also be thrown or even used as a heavy object on a pressure plate, opening a passage or unlocking something far off or nearby. Potions can be drunk or thrown depending on what they're made for, items, so weapons and armor can worn out after intensive use and even be broken, and spells have to be readied before they can be cast. So, as you can see, Dark Spire is not a joke, and it will test your genre-specific skills to their limits. One thing that's particularly not my cup of tea though, but will most likely not be an issue for others, is that the game runs in real time. I prefer my RPGs turn-based, but that's me and it shouldn't really reflect on the game's quality. So if you don't mind it too much, Darkspire is something that you should definitely check out. Silingrix is a 3v3 3D arcade shooter with 360 degrees rotation and arenas in the shapes of cylinders, hence the name. Each arena that your team of three will take the opponents on is different. Features unique to its physics and atmospheric conditions and initial configuration. So, for each, you must choose your team wisely to not only win against the opponents but also survive the environment. There are 37 warriors slash pilots from 10 different races to choose from, and they all have their own skills, strong and weak points too. There's also 8 vehicles described with maneuverability, speed and firepower, and combining the right crafts with correct drivers for given cylinders challenges is a key to victory. The action is fast and frantic, so fast in fact that in the heat of the moment, if you've not played the game countless times before, it may be difficult to differentiate friend from foe. But the more you play, the more you get to familiarize yourself with the controls, vehicles, challenges and how everything works, the better you will be and the easier each encounter will become. The innovative, complex and entertaining gameplay is definitely Silent strongest suit, and the adrenaline-pumping experience of each combat will no doubt keep you entertained for hours, if you can excuse the game's presentation that is. Cause while it's full 3D and easily readable so to speak, it lacks textures, detail and polish. Now, perhaps it was deliberate choice to keep it fast and smooth on most systems of the time, but I feel that it could look a lot better. To summarize, if you're on the edge and don't know if you should try it out or not, and the graphics don't look particularly interesting to you, think of it as Tempest 2000, but in full real 3D and with rotation. So a game that isn't good because it looks great, but it's good because it plays fantastic and is hella addicting. And then try it out. If you think that you've seen Deadly Racer somewhere but the name does not ring the bell, it's cause it uses the same engine as an earlier rally championship did. It's not a simulator or a physics based racer though, but what it lacks in realism it more than makes up for in the fun department. It features 10 different cars to choose from, all of them differently specced and behaving on the tracks and all modeled after the real life counterparts, though named in a copyright safe manner. 
So your Porsche would be Corsha, Toyota Celica is Toyosa Celica, and Lancia Delta is aptly named Mencia, and so on. Plenty different names not to get sued, but also familiar enough to be easily recognizable. There are three gameplay modes of practice, single race and world tournament rally, and automatic or manual gearbox. You can choose between four sceneries of city, marsh, desert and snow too, and your car, regardless which you'll choose, feels entirely different on each, taking track conditions, weather and their microclimate in mind. I've been talking about it for a little while now, and there's still nothing here that would justify the deadly in the title, right? Well, it's all down to how the races run, because you have two different meters for your cars, fuel and damage. And you must be careful how you drive, cause couple of jumps too many or few curb collisions more than it's reasonable and your race may be over. Deadly Racer is obviously an arcade game and as such it's really fun. And as soon as you get used to the controls, the damage should be something that you don't worry too much about, having mastered all the cars that is. But initially at least, make sure to keep an eye on the meter as it may make or break your game. Graphics and sounds are fantastic at least for a top-down racer, and the digitized cars work well on a minutely detailed backgrounds in various weather and track conditions. All that combined with a constant roar of your powerful engine will make Deadly Racer a blast. Keep in mind, however, that just as I said, controls take a minute to get used to, and before you do, it is actually a really demanding, even if not a simulation title. Cyril Cyberpunk, aka Cyberboard Kit, both titles are equally as stupid I must note, is a side view always scrolling sci fi themed arcade platformer. In the near future on Manhattan, Cyril, the friendly neighborhood style icon of a kid, listens to the airwaves scanning for. I really don't know what for. Love, gossip, hard to tell. Especially that he's scanning the radio waves in the future, so not doing anything that sounds even remotely futuristic. But whatever, he does what nerds do. And he accidentally hears about aliens invasion plan of Earth. Now, how did he understood them? I don't know. But he grabs his hoverboard and a pellet gun and sets off to save the world. And that kids is another of those game logic things that needs no explanation, no reason behind it, he just does. Oh, and guess what the aliens are? Don't look at the screen, just guess. In large part, they're mechanized plushy bears. Yup, you heard that right. Another one for the bucket of so-called game logic based choices. So, there are 16 types of these teddy bear enemies, 6 bosses and few other random bodies of nondescript origin too, all within a rather robust 32 levels of a game. And if by looking at this Cyril you feel that it kinda reminds you of Commander King, then you're right, he plays similar too, with a difference of having considerably better and yet less readable so to speak graphics, much smaller window view being as zoomed in as it is, and worst of all, it's devoid of everything that made Commander King fun. Cyril Cyberpunk is well put together from a technical point of view platformer, but with not much entertainment value to it. So while it's easily playable from start to finish, I don't feel anyone will feel the urge to complete this nice looking but at best average platformer. Devgate is a point-and-click fantasy adventure based on the best-selling novels by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. 2000 years ago, the world was split into five realms, all by the hand of an advanced and evil race known only as Sartan. The humans, dwarfs and elves were split between four of these worlds named for the four elements, and the race of Patrin were banished to the deadly labyrinth. 2000 years have passed in a heartbeat for humanoids living in the sunlight, but Patrin were constantly trying to find a way out. Eventually they sorta of did. You play as Haplo, a young patron that's given a quest by his lord XR to travel through the death gate into each of the worlds to find their seal pieces so that the planet could be reconstructed and so patrons could have their revenge on the Sartan. Death gate for the most part plays like most other first person adventures so you travel around different locations, find and use items, converse with characters and solve various puzzles, many of which are inventory based and some will require use of magic. Magic that's heavily integrated into the entire gameplay and games engine too same as it was in original's book story. Now, I've never played Deathgate, but from what I've seen and read about it, it's clear that it's a hidden gem. Not only it features captivating and excellently written story, but also different, novel and not unfairly difficult puzzles and a very high production value, with full SVGA presentation, nice animations and expertly recorded voice acting. If you like adventure games, don't sleep on it. And if you don't, give it a go anyway, it may be something down your alley. My first experience with Dangerous Streets was through a gaming mug seeing it on screenshots. It looked amazing. Huge, colorful and uniquely designed characters fighting it out in an interestingly looking locales. It had to be great. I mean it looked as good, if arguably not better even than Street Fighter 2 did. 
And my Amiga, yes, cause it was back when I still had an Amiga, could definitely use another excellent fighter. This, those version, is identical to the Amiga original, for better or worse. Nope, no, 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 I cannot contain it anymore, it's not even for worse, it's for worst. W-O-R-S-T, it's easily one of the worst versus fighting games ever made, the smelliest of gaming poops out there. You see, Dangerous Streets is a game that looks really good on the screenshots, so good in fact that it may lure you into getting it if you've not read the review of it anywhere. And when you do finally bring it home and run it, oh my days, it will be painful. It will hurt you in your gut and wallet, cause you've just thrown away money on the trashiest game out there, and it will hurt your head and your eyes alike being as jumpy with maybe a frame or two of animations at most for each of the moves. Those animations are so terrible, in fact, that when coupled with difficult to go to collision boxes, most of the time you don't even know if you're hitting the opponent or not. And since not every move has a visible feedback, because why would it have one in a fighting game, it's more of a game of chance rather than skill. Though, ultimately, you've lost it already anyway, since you've got the game in the first place. And I don't even mean all of it with special moves, cause while there are some in the game, pulling them off may be borderline impossible given the controls are as clunky as the presentation is. In short, Dangerous Streets looks, sounds and plays awful, and I wouldn't recommend it to my worst enemy, to my nemesis even. In fact, so inhumane that I don't think it could be even used as a means of torture, cause having to play this monstrosity may be comparable to having your nails being pulled out. It's a nightmare. But, so that I'm in a clear and gave you everything that there is to know about it, and so that you wouldn't think that I've skipped something important, Dangerous Streets can be played in single player, two player and so-called tournament mode, where you face all the opponents with one of the eight fighters that you pick for yourself, and it features standard combinations of weak, medium and strong attacks, along with an unknown number of specials. Unknown, cause pulling them off without fail to confirm that they're there and not just glitches seems impossible. In the last video in the series I've said that Creep Clash is worse than Dangerous Streets, but having to come back to it again and relieve the nightmare once more, even if through perspective of research, Amica port on emulation and YouTube videos only, makes me question that statement. I think it's best that you decide which is worse all by yourself. You take the mental hit this time. Let me start by saying that I'm not a religious person at all and I do not believe in any higher spiritual beings, singular or plural. I'm convinced that there may be aliens out there, Muffy's strong factor confirming the possibility, but that's pretty much it. Once in a while though, when the stars align, a miracle happens and we actually get a religion-themed game that's not that bad. And Defender of the Faith, The Adventures of David, is, dare I say it, decent. It's not a full price worthy title, that's for sure, but it's not a stinker like many of these sadly tend to be. Sadly, cause while I'm not a believer myself, I see a potential in those biblical stories to be a basis for a decent adventure or platforming title. And most games based on it end up being trash. Anyway, Defender of the Faith is a side view action game based on the story of King David from the Bible. It is broken into six episodes, each with its own objective to complete and based on an episode from David's life. So stuff like protecting sheep from marauding beasts, dueling with Goliath, escaping a kill plot on his life by the king, proving his good intentions to the king, which on a side note makes me question why would anyone want to prove their intentions to the king that just tried to kill you, it's beyond my scope of understanding. Then there's sneaking into a camp and taking refuge in the hills. And finally, saving his family from captivity. David's life, it seems, was full of adventures big and small, seemingly more than many could have over a series of lifetimes. Anyway, each next level is a bit more difficult than the last and they may also feature some simple environmental puzzling, mostly focused on where to go or what to do next. Nothing too demanding. And it would have been a pretty fun game overall, if not the devs really, really, really wanting to make it a chore. So after each level, you are whisked from the Bible. So, for players like myself, who could complete the entire game as is, all those extra points from Bible knowledge will be for fate. I don't know any of the passages, I've never read it, and I don't intend to do it in a foreseeable future either. Is it a game-breaking addition? No, not in the slightest, but it's a bit annoying that some of us will never get a chance to get those bonus points. That said, if I'm to be honest, Defender of the Faith is a one-off type of a game, meaning you complete it once and forget about it forever. So I retract my earlier comment, as in the long run, the points, normal or bonus won't mean anything if you're not going to be replaying Defender of the Faith for points anyway. With this third season of our series ending, we've covered 300 games overall. Hope that you liked this trip down the memory lane as much as I did. And you can count on me carrying on, as I'm far from being done talking about those games. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. 
smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.